You are now listening to the Hunter's Advantage Podcast. We preserve the history and sport of hunting through curious conversation and action-packed hunts, as well as offering you tips and strategy for more successful hunts. Uh, Hey everybody, welcome back to the Hunter's Advantage podcast, episode number 166, and we are joined by the Ranch Ferry, aka Troy Fowler. How are you doing? Thanks for joining us today. Well, I went fishing for six hours this morning, and I'm doing great. I mean, what else is there? I'm tan, a picture of health. Everything's great here in Cedar Park, Texas. There you go. What were you fishing for? So, before... Five years ago, I decided that I was going to catch a 10-pound bass. And it took me four years. And I caught a 10-5. And there's a lake that I have fished a lot that I've caught a bunch of sevens out of. And that bastard owes me a 10-pound bass. And they're in there. (laughs) So I caught the 10 out of another lake. And um, so I'm just grinding out there. Like, it's just one of them damn things I'm going to catch. That lake's going to give me a 10-pound bass. I spent so much time out there. And it was really frustrating. I had the um, equivalent of an uh, under-penetrating arrow today. I'm pulling across this rock. I know it's underwater. Got it marked on my electronics. And rod just bends. I mean, it, and I, I, mean I, I sucked this fish at 20 feet mm. on a Texas rig. And I jacked him. Starts pulling drag, and I went, all right. Comes out of the water. It was probably a six or seven, and just the hook came back. And the worm had gone all the way down the hook and was covering the point of the hook. So he basically just had it in his mouth and was swimming around with it. Mm. And I was just like. They usually happen to me, but it's like a six or seven pound log. About that. I caught five that were two pounds. Whoopee freaking do. I don't care about that. <laughs> That would be I, my biggest. I took my brother out here um, on a guided fishing trip one time. He came down from Oklahoma and he caught a six and a half pounder on a topwater frog, biggest fish he had ever caught. Yeah, uh, right. That's a awesome. lot of fun. I caught a in the while trying to catch a ten pounder. I caught a lot of fish from six to eight. I never broke eight, and then I just jumped to ten and a half. Just in one, just happened to throw it in the right spot at the right time in the right place in the right lake, but. Yeah. Anyway, so I, that lake goes, man, I'm going to continue to grind out there. Yeah, I keep after it. Yeah, right. Did, uh, I got old. I'm with you. Did you, have you been after the pigs at all? I mean, I saw a, a hunting we just got back. Out. We just got done with the hunting public and they shot five, four or five. Had a great time. Saw a bunch of turkeys. My deer. And it's good to have a lot of hunters out tell me how my deer are doing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. All the bucks are coming up to the feeders like, man, look at that one. Look at that one. I'm like, great. Don't need cameras. I got these yahoos with cameras. Perfect. <laughs> and our deer down there are about halfway done. Like they're, they rut in late September, October in Victoria County. And so they get hard horn pretty fast. Like I'm expecting to see hard horns in six weeks. Really? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And they Mid- drop them early too. Mid August, you're seeing hard horns? Yeah. Wow. Yep. Yeah. And they rut pretty hard in late September, October, and then we get a secondary rut in November. But we've been after them. I've, I've been chasing a pig locally. I've got a lease over here. Not really a lease. A friend of mine runs the place. But there's this pig I've been after for three years. I call him the wrinkle belly because he's got wrinkles. Like, he's so fat. He's just got, like, wobbles on his side. The pigs out here are very domestic. The pigs down in at the ranch have a lot of Russian and they're more feral. What I mean by that is a feral hog, meaning just they are feral. They're loose. They tend to get narrower. Their asses tend to be low and they tend to have a kind of a humped back. And the pigs out here are very, they have a lot of domestic in them. They got curly tails. They got big old asses on them. Like they're, (laughs) they're square. Like yeah. the big ones are huge because they they weigh a ton because they got such big butts on them. They look like a pig pig. They, they got the face of a feral hog, but their mm-hmm. build is – they're like a box walking through the bushes. It's unbelievable how much bigger they are. And this pig probably weighs 260. Good we killed one that weighed, 
We killed one by 270 last year with a rifle, but the guy who lives out there, he was trying to get me to kill it, and it was down in the bottom of a canyon going to a feeder, and the wind was just not workable. I just told him, shoot the stupid pig. It took him four hunts. He got busted twice, you know, shooting a rifle at 70 yards, and he finally killed it, and he's like, man, he's bigger than I thought. And they look like they got legs about that long. And then this huge, but the shorter the legs look, that means they're huge. And that thing weighed, that thing hung 270. That's a great big animal. I mean, just not for pigs, just big. So I think old Winkle Belly's probably, I think he's 260. I, I, I really do. He's fat. So would that be the biggest one you've ever shot so, so far? Do what? Would that be the biggest one you've shot so far? I've got a 265. 265. So yeah. when I was when I first started fiddling around with the heavy arrow stuff, so I bow hunted since I was 12. I'm pre-carbon. I hunted with a longbow with wood arrows. I've killed stuff with flint, which is really cool. Um, I shot a stick for 10 years and woodies and the whole nine yards. And so I'm pre-carbon. So back when I was a kid, nobody weighed their arrows. Well, I'm promise you, an aluminum 2018 weighs 600 grains and it weighs an ounce. <laughs> They're heavy, and we just didn't. Nobody thought about it. You just move your pins and, and shoot. And we mm-hmm. never left arrows and animals. It was really, really weird. And then here comes. I don't know. Have y'all ever seen an overdraw? Yeah. Y'all are kind of young bucks, so I haven't seen that. In the yeah. aluminum days, we had these things that was, went behind the riser toward you. And you would shoot an arrow that was like, I would, I'm 28 and a half inches. You could shoot like a 25 inch arrow with a broad head, mind you. The arrow's three inches behind your hand. No, thank you. I don't know how that would work. That's probably no, all the pictures you see of like your arrows running to the hands. No, I got it. But back then, this was a free country. So you could do <laughs> stupid crap and everybody just said, well, whatever. If you shoot his arm off and to hell with you. Fine, dumbass. Anyway, that's how we got to go faster. So you try to get the lightest aluminum you could and shoot an overdrive. It was a tuning nightmare. I mean, you can only imagine the torque with the area. You're hearing arrows back three inches behind your hands. I mean, if you twitched, it just flew crazy. And then they started shooting carbons on the overdrive. And the sound of the bows was spectacular. (laughs) It sounded like a cannon going off. And then um, right when I started having trouble... um, just shooting pigs at feeders, started struggling on big ones. I started just hunting big ones and letting, I went to the herds pass multiple times, just not even shoot. And I was about 50% on them at deer feeders when I shot the big ones with every mechanical you ever thought of, fixed blades, no arrow tuning, no knock tuning, just kind of regular shot stuff, right? I didn't know. Anyway, back to the pig. So when I started exploring the Ashby stuff, I pulled out my stick bow. I bare shaft tuned it. I built an end arrow. It weighed 680 grains. I'm pulling 54 pounds. And I go stalking around, and the biggest pig I've ever killed the dates, the target animal that I end up in front of. And I shot that pig right there, and it penetrated five feet. Zipped right through. It absolutely uh, went. The broad head stuck out the ham on a pig that was six feet long. He was probably six and a half feet long. And I went, hmm. And there is the impetus of the channel. Because I went, if that's slow bow, that bow, I bet that arrow's going 150 feet per second. I mean, it's a long bow. It's 54 pounds, 680 grain arrow. It's, I never, I didn't have a chronograph at the time, but it was pretty lopy. <laughs> and I said, well, if we take that arrow and put it on a compound and get 40 or 50 feet per second on a better trajectory, but it should do exactly what it just did to that pig. I couldn't believe it penetrated that far. Yeah, that's that's interesting. I drew out for a uh, a really good um, recurve only hunt in Oklahoma this year, mm-hmm. um, and I started shooting a recurve recently. And my uncle gave me a bunch of his arrows and his bows, fifty pounds, and I was just weighing them for craps and giggles because they shot two bucks last year with their recurve, and they were uh-huh. like, "Man, I did I got no penetration on either of those shots." They were really disappointed. And I weighed their arrow the other day. It was like 405 grains. So, yeah, right. Huh. That's 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 pretty light for there's for also time. that's pretty light. So let's go, let's just say that. But there's also a very good chance they didn't tune them at all. 
So there's a hundred percent chance they didn't. Okay. They shot them <laughs> like we all did. You just shoot and go, that one seems to fly really good. Well, your naked eye ain't catching up. Like, Woo. So what's your tuning strategy for your recurve outside of the barrel mass? Me? I'm, I've shot one for a week, so I have no idea. All right. So there's this freaking idiot out there, and his name is the Ranch Fairy. <laughs> he has a YouTube channel, and apparently it pisses off a lot of people and helps a ton of people. And I have a full traditional tuning process that's on there. It, you, you actually cut the arrow down mm-hmm. incrementally from full length. <clears throat> And you just start cutting it back till it stiffens up and shoots straight. It's the damnedest thing you've ever done. Interesting. It's like black magic. And then when you find the length of the arrow and the spine, all you have to do is replicate it. Mm-hmm. So for me, I shoot 54 pounds at 20, the bow's 54, 28. I don't get there. I got about a 27 inch draw with a comp with a recurve or with my longbow because I kind of shoot hunched up. And I shoot a 28 and three quarter inch, 400 spine arrow with 300 grains up front. And they will shoot 40 yards bear shaft like a bullet. Bear shaft? I thought, I thought bear shaft arrows wanted to kind of teeter up and the fletching is what kind of holds them down. Is that No, not you can get it to shoot absolutely dead nuts. Really? Absolutely. But, you, but what I did was, so... You're shooting it, just get a target that doesn't move, or you'll absolutely need drugs. Because if the target moves, you'll never get good readings. You'll get crazy readings all the time. If you like drugs, then don't strap the target down. Whatever, that's on you. So you take a full length arrow, and for a right handed shooter, ideally the arrow hits like that to the right. It over bends like crazy, hmm. super soft, but it's also five and a half or six inches too long. You cut an inch off and it will go right, but not as much. You're stiffening the shaft. So you leave the point fixed, but you're cutting the knock in. You pull the knock. That's why carvers are awesome. Back in the woody days, we have to saw it off, retaper it with a taper tool, shoot it, keep going, glue it, glue it. It took forever. So just let's just say you're going to shoot a 200 grain point and a 100 grain insert. That's fixed. You pull the knock, you cut an inch off, and it will come in and go like that. Hmm. You trim it half an inch, and it'll start slowly getting on the shot line. So all of a sudden, you'll hit some length, and it will absolutely go zowie down the middle. <laughs> like it's re- it's ridiculous how awesome it is. That's kind of crazy. So basically, you just got to tweak because I'm I'm a. I'm a simpleton. I'm a layman when it comes to like arrows and stuff like growing up, growing up my arrow situation when I first started get, getting into bow hunting, when I was like maybe around 15 years old was, uh, whatever arrows were in my dad's closet. No, and, I, dude, we all did it. Yeah. And there's it, still 50% of bow hunters out there doing that. Well, I, I, I was guilty of that until probably about 2018. So however old I was then I I'm, I'm not sure, but, uh, uh, yeah, and, and then kind of broadheads were the same way, which that's a different topic, which I'm sure we'll touch on here here later. But for the most part, they were just those old aluminum arrows where if they were long enough where you could draw back without it popping off the, the wh- it, whisker bro, biscuit, that's, that's yeah, kind of what, where I'll we were. Stuff to death like that. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> there's been there's been a lot of times that that uh, I mean, unknowingly, like it really wasn't that big of a problem because at the time when you're first starting to get into hunting, especially, you know, whitetail hunting and stuff like you didn't know to play the wind. And so most of the time you weren't really seeing a lot of deer. And so therefore you weren't shooting a whole lot. So when you did, it's just like, oh man, I must've just had buck fever or what it may be. But I guess what I'm trying to ask is, is how long ago did this arrow craze happen? Because I just kind of got in the game when, when you were already Heck, I'm not even in the game right now on the arrow craze, I, I would say. But, like, how long ago did this start kind of taking off? 2015 or so. Is that when you so, made your channel? I I'm, I sound like an ass, but I'm the <laughs> impetus of the whole thing. And I See, was never intended to be that. I thought I was going to have 2,000 subscribers. They were going to leave me the hell alone so I can catch 10-pound bass. 
<laughs> and I'd be the dork that no one listens to. Like that's mm-hmm. wizard stuff. And I think what happened, I'm 54 years old, so I'm more philosophical than I was. If I was 30, and, oh, good God, I had so much energy. I would spin you guys out of the podcast. Like it would, be, <laughs> it would it just turn me off. It, I was annoying. And I'm pretty annoying now. So looking back and standing outside, like I'm a sales, I'm a sales guy with a 20-year sales career and senior manager and all that bull crap. And I always try to sell things from the other side of the desk. I always try to figure out what the hell, why is this occurring? Why do they want what I'm selling? And if I was in their chair, what would I be doing? Mm-hmm. That way you can try to make a match rather than me bludgeoning you over the head and you hit me back. Let's try to figure out what, why the hell anybody wants to do this or I'll go home. Trying to fill in a gap. Sure. And I don't, I, I think a lot of, there's been a lot of comments and stuff. And of course, you all have a YouTube channel. So y'all get all the stupid trolls and hay mail and all that stuff. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and if you were a doorknob painter, we'd get hay mail. And um, I think there was unmet demand that a lot of experienced people could resonate with. And I think my timing was right with no plan. So I had no business plan. I didn't want to spend any money. That's why I used my iPhone. Everybody's like, you should get a real camera. I said, why? It's worth it. <laughs> I just hold it backwards and go, yeah. Everybody's used to my kind of half-assed style. But it's information, right? It's, it's coaching. So I don't need B-roll and see the birds fly by and all that. For if you're doing hunting like y'all do, you need to do that. I get it. I'm not knocking you. It's just not my thing. So looking back, I guess there was unmet demand that we have now filled and then it turned into arrow craze. And that turns into the hate mail of, this is just the next thing and it'll go away. Well, shooting a deer and having it go 35 yards will not go away. People like not tracking. They really do. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I may disappear and somebody else will take my place, that's fine. And to quite frankly, I've thought about turning the damn thing off and just go fishing. So. Um, I kept my real job. So I have kind of, I'm kind of in a weird spot. I really could turn it off tomorrow and I wouldn't die, man. I've been 54 years without all this crap and I, I've got my real job. So I think that's it. I, I think there was, I think what I talk about was occurring in the field and I couldn't see that. I only knew from my own experience, dude, we hunted deer feeders. It's not like there's random distance. Mm -hmm. Pigs are kind of jumpy, so they're a pain in the ass. So they're the ultimate whitetail bouncing around kind of problem when you have a good deer in front of you and it decides to move. They never stand still. So you get that dynamic, known distance, and still struggling. And then when I started shooting real arrows with real broadheads on them, brother, I wind the tape back, and if I hit them in the vital V, I don't even wait they're dead and I'm an RT, which means I understand why they're dead. I'm not being an arrogant ass. When you shoot them low and forward, they can't survive it. There's no two hour death thing when you hit them right above the elbow, low in the lower one third. There's no, it's not possible. If I hit one kind of weird, I'll leave and go to camp and have whiskey and then go back to that. <laughs> Right? Calm the nerves a little bit. Mm-hmm. Why do you why do you think that shooting a heavy arrow, focusing on tuning and lethality, why is that so polarizing, guys? I can't tell you the amount of ranch fairy piss missile memes that I've seen on social oh, media. I, I, I just like, I, that's why I don't participate in any much social media stuff. I just it's ridiculous. I that 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 answer is not that is the only thing I can think is that the herd is more important to the humans than being right. I'd agree with that. So Kane said, it's better to be mostly right than precisely wrong. John Maynard Keynes. He was kind of smart since he made his own economic system or analysis. And I think it's the herd. I think everybody's safe with what's common. And 
when I came out of the womb, I didn't give a hoot in hell. People think I'm just, <laughs> I don't give a shit. <laughs> People don't understand. I'm really weird. And in that capacity, right is right. North is always north. If it's dark or raining or lightning, north is north. And when I started following Ed's, you know, process and strategy, Ed's awesome, by the way. Y'all want to call him. I'll give you his number. Y'all need to call him. Yeah, for sure. Okay. Um, I was like, this is like an algorithm. It's a 12-step algorithm to a penetrator. And he didn't study uh, how far he could shoot. He didn't study, uh, you know, shooting styles. He didn't study any of that stuff. All he said was impact. The second part of this is um, when you're trying to sell stuff, and I'm guilty, I have my own system. It's the only company that would build arrows the way I want them built. Good inserts, got some weight up front. My broadhead is only offered in 200 grains. What the hell would you shoot something lighter than that for? And because it doesn't bend, doesn't break, it's super durable. We can talk about that too. But when, when the companies are trying to sell a single thing, there's currently some fletching out that is amazing, apparently. It fixes all things. Well, that's bull crap. You get your 400 spine arrow and a 28 inch draw and 70 pounds. Good luck. Yeah, get fletching ain't gonna fix that. Getting a broadhead to fly accurately to bow hunt. Okay. It's really challenging when the bending rates are out of whack. And so there's all these simple, there's people with broadhead companies that broadhead fixes everything. The arrow guys say their arrow fixes everything. The fletching guy has got this magic new fletching, says he's got the solution. No, it's all of it. It's all of it. I'll tell you what I've been surprised by. I offer the most difficult, annoying process to possibly send you to Alcoholics Anonymous or <laughs> read on the earth and it took off. I want you to shoot every single arrow bear shot. Everyone. Then Fletcher. Then shoot your broadheads and learn to sharpen. Well, that takes time, Troy. I, I got that. <laughs> that's what I can't, that's the part that I can't um I can't believe happened. How much stuff we've sold even before I had sponsors and serious I, I sold serious for them for a year before I signed with them to become a sponsor. And the number of people willing to go through the hell that is setting up a really setting up a real set of lethal arrows, I'm I'm going away. People care. There's a crap ton of people who really want to get it right. What that brings me, I like I like that you touched on the Ashby stuff. Can you kind of give an overview on the foundation and what the what the goal is and like studying arrow lethality and maybe kind of how they do a little bit of that? Because I think there's a lot of listeners who maybe heard that name in some podcasts yeah. before, but have you know don't have a good amount or a grasp of what it is. Well, so I got to back up to Ed and it'll explain the mission. So Ed lives in Rock Springs. He's one of the most humble guys on earth for somebody who's shot two rhinos with a longbow and everything else. And I just want to say, say this. If there's a guy who should get on the message boards and tell everybody to blow it out their ass, <laughs> it's him, mm -hmm. right? It's him. He would never do that. He's one of the most humble people I've ever met. He's always trying to figure out the next test we need to do. He's got three pages of stuff that we haven't done yet. Okay. So his study in the very shortest story was um, South Africa asked him in the early 80s, the, the continent was closed to bow hunting, professional bow hunting. Trust me, there's a lot of bow hunting going on in South Africa, but professional safari style hunts were not allowed. Three states, there are three countries had it, so it doesn't matter. 85% of the country was close. His study was a is written in white paper fashion for the government of Africa to assess lethality. 
of a bow. That's why it was written. And then it kept going after that. Like he got, he went totally nerd and just went crazy, right? After that. He said one thing. In all situations, how do you get an arrow to go through whatever it hits? And that's the mission of the Ashby Foundation now is to step on top of what he got hurt. He fell off a mountain or something, broke his back or something, hunting sheep. And so he couldn't go to compounds. So he chose the slowest bow platform, theoretically the least amount of energy, and knew that compounds would work. Okay, so if a stick bow will kill a rhino, you get you an 80-pound compound in that same arrow, it's going to be fine. Yeah. But if you did the compounds, it doesn't necessarily work backwards. And we don't know that answer either. So the, the, the next step is the modern tests of the modern systems with modern gear. That's what the foundation is doing now. And what was, what was some of the findings that they found and maybe presented to the government on what does cause arrow lethality from the result of Ashby's findings? Penetration is the only thing that matters. If it never penetrates, nothing dies. And then as the size of the animals go up, you really need to be thinking more like a rifle. So here in Texas, a 243 is a kick-ass deer box gun. All over the state, 150 yards in, out of a deer blind, 100 grain, 243 with a decent bullet in it, it was flat out badass. Not an elk rifle. Oh, it can be done. It's not an elk rifle. It's not a Western 300 yard, you know, shoot across a canyon gun. Because see the, va- the, see the vapor trails? <laughs> Correct. Vapor. It's not a vapor trail thing. This is a, this is where the 30 calibers come up and all the six, five nitwits out there shooting 147 grain bullets. Whoopie freaking do. <laughs> so, um, most people with firearms make that jump. Like you get a, you know, 300, 300 wind mag or 30 six or something with a little bit more jump to go out West. But everybody just assumes arrows are arrows. And it gets done, but I don't know that it's the most. I know actually, I, it's not. It's, I know it's not the most lethal platform across multiple species. And then you don't know what you're going to hit, and that's a problem. You will never know what you're going to hit. On the penetration front, there's probably a lot of folks that have had many experiences shooting something and getting little to no penetration and sitting there duped wondering why. I used to shoot a 400 spine arrow with 65 or 70 pounds, you know, in high school and middle school. And I've, I've drug, I've dug them in two inches, not even the length of a Kit Kat and watch an arrow twizzle and run all the way out there. What is the main driver of penetration? Mass is, well, arrow flight is probably the first problem. So I'm going to actually use Ed's list. Structural integrity is the number one thing. If, if, the, air, if the broadhead, this is the broadhead, there's yeah. way too much breathing of the exhaust fumes and re- idiocy about inserts. They are a straw man. Big sleeves and footers and all this stuff. Outserts, all that stuff, yeah. I have a sleeve system on my head, on my arrows. 100 grains, that's it until I get it. Okay? I don't mind them, but the, the idea that you're going to overwhelm a broadhead that is failing on impact with an insert is ridiculous. If the tip bends, if it snaps off, and one of the things, I'm 100% convinced, but I can't prove this. When I was shooting lower quality broadheads, and what I mean is stainless blades, the ones that are replaceable and probably Chinese steel, which doesn't mean it's bad steel, just means nobody cares what the bid price was and what they got, whoever's making it. I lost some pigs where I got half an arrow in them and I hit them pretty good. And I honestly think from my background in the medical world, the blades were dull. And they never cut the internal organs, so they ran much further than they should have. 
And I've only seen that anecdotally because coming backwards now that I learned how to sharpen and strop. And when you shave your arm, the hair jumps off. It doesn't fall on the blade. It jumps off. And when I hit them right, there may not be much of a blood trail because they only have 50 yards and they're dead. In the 400 spine case, I don't have an arrow. Dad gummit. Can you cut this? Yeah. Okay. Go grab one. Hang on. Let me go get some points. All right. Let's see if I can. Oh my gosh. Look at that sucker. Part of back. Oh, this is Big Jake. <laughs> Jake Hubesman. I've already got it. Structural integrity is no good. But oh, no. So with a 400 spine arrow that's massively under spine, nobody will be surprised that I'm acting like this. What's happening is you're going fast and the shaft is going like this the whole way down the shot line. So the broadhead is also doing this and the it can hit like that and the shaft is bit like that. So it, it goes like that and all the energy is lost. Mm-hmm. Because the shaft is so soft that there's two things. One, it's got massive reverberation. It's also rotating. So if you think about think about this, jumping rope and running sideways at the same time. It'd be and difficult. The rope is your arrow. That made my brain hurt. <laughs> think about that. <laughs> it's a pretty easy visual though for taking yeah. you out of it. Yeah. The rope swinging and going downrange. Mm-hmm. That's what an underspined, poorly tuned arrow is doing. It's bent, rotating, and flying forward. And so what happens is, instead of the arrow, the broadhead hitting and driving, because it's stabilized or more stable, it hits in this shape. Okay? Mm-hmm. Got, hang on. Fletching like that. Arrow's bent. Broadhead's downhill. Broadhead's going to hit, and all the energy is going to go that direction. That's exactly what happens with under under spine stuff. So so uh, let's say you're not shooting at an animal. Let's say you're shooting at like a bag target or something. Is that what causes your arrows to hit sideways? Kind of where you're shooting from downrange, but yet when you walk up to it in a straight line, your arrow seems like it's kind of counted or or probably, angled up a little it's bit. Probably never straight to begin with. Mm-hmm. Just so visually, you're used to seeing whatever it's doing. That doesn't mean what you see is right. Well, it's I've heard. Weird. It's super weird. When you do the, Christian, when you do the cut down thing, mm-hmm. and you get those arrows flying, and Jake, you're going to, you shoot a stick bow too, right? I'm sorry? You shoot no, a stick bow? Uh, no, no. Okay. I, I do not. I'm not man enough. <laughs> when you When you get those arrows cut down and shooting like a dart, you're going to be amazed what they look like leaving the boat mm-hmm. they look like they're it's just a laser there's no wiggle so a bag target jake if you shoot a bag target it's the bag target mm-hmm. bags are pretty soft so they are very untrue readings you got anybody listening if you bear shaft tune do not use a bag because the bag inherently lets it sag and so they're good for stopping arrows mm-hmm but the readings that you get off of them are not true. So if you if you're seeing that in foam, or if you're seeing that in a block, and let's assume the block's not moving. So generally, if you stick whatever target X on the ground, you hit it, it moves. Yeah, it's very true. So it'll drive you nuts if you think that bags are terrible. Okay. As far as they're good targets. They're just not good for getting any kind of a positive reading as to what your arrow's doing in the air. Best thing to do is get an iPhone, put it behind you, and put it on slow mo and watch the launch. Like get somebody like over your shoulder, like shooting that way, like you're here. Get somebody right behind you mm-hmm. and try to catch from the minute it leaves the string in the first five feet. You're doomed if it doesn't take off pretty straight. Well, I've I've watched the um, some ten thousand FPS like videos of arrows, and it will put it in perspective how much an arrow 
can in the air. You you, you never see it with your naked you eye. You can't see it. You but can't, it, it, they wobble. Right. There's confirmation bias there that you see. Well, here's how confirmation bias works with arrows. They the arrow flew and hit the bullseye. Thus, my arrow flight must be good. Mm -hmm. Your arrow flight might be crap, but your brain starts to imprint on what you see because they they seem accurate. And they cut the fletchings off. I tell people all that all the time. Hey, man, cut the fletchings off one of your arrows. Send it. Don't have anybody standing. Don't have anybody standing to the side. <laughs> it might take and off. What, you, what you're going to learn by cutting those fletchings off is when you're shooting with the bear trap, there is nothing to correct that arrow while it's in flight, right? That's what the fletchings are doing. Yeah, fletchings mask some massive amounts of arrow flight. We did a deal. We and the Rocket Man did a deal just for shits and giggles. I put a 300 grain point and had a 100 grain insert on a 300 spine arrow, which is for my bow already a little under spine, but it's way under spine with 400 grains up front. And I shot it like 15 yards with a high speed camera. And the arrow went in and flew tip up, which blew my mind, and tore about a foot. A foot? So it entered the paper at about a 35 degree angle. It was it was stable. Like it it didn't wiggle or anything. It just went doop, and flew like that for 15 yards, perfectly stable, but tip up. I put a fletching on the back. And it almost shot a bullet hole. And the, we know for a fact that it was it was launching like that. So that means that it launched like this and then the Fletchens corrected it. But what happens, right? So for listeners, you say, hey, man, I mean, obviously the Fletchen did the jump. No, that's bull crap. Put a, put a broadhead on in front of that. They're not aerodynamic. Mm -hmm. So what they'll do is catch the wind. And then they'll start wobbling like that. And that's why a lot of the fixed blade stuff. Think about what an example I just showed you with the four inch wide arrow, it's bent. And then it's pushing a three blade muzzy. Okay. And an angle like that into the wind. And then it's snapping back and forth as it goes down range and just catching all kind of wind. I've got a, every time I've done this, I've been laughed at. And that's the goal. I fletched an arrow on the front and the back. Okay. I fletched one, like there's an insert and a field point and I fletched little tiny one inch fletchings. Mm -hmm. I said, will that fly? I've never had anyone say no or yes. They all say, no, that's stupid. When I said, that's fixed blade broadhead. I put a fixed blade broadhead on the front of an arrow. You just see fletchings. So That's you true. see drag, but your brain never said broad has drag. <laughs> yeah. But you understand enough of just not really drag, but we're going to go with that because it's the common terminology. But aerodynamic is not drag. But when I put the fletchings on the front, it was like everybody went, oh my God. Like I, I kind of understand what the ass end of the air does. And when you put fletchings on the front, I understand why fixed blade broadheads do what they do. It's a one. I need to. I also should. I should, should do a video. I'm probably going to do a video on that because it's it's eye popping, right? Yeah, Jake. Yes. I saw your head go. God, God, damn, right. Like that's not the dumbest thing I ever heard in my life. That is, yeah, yeah. That's <laughs> that is true. I just, I'm just not. You could you could feed me anything right now, and I'd be like, "That's probably true." Just because I'm, my my knowledge of arrows and stuff is is of a toddler right now. Well, tell me what you're shooting. Uh, I'm shooting. Uh, are you talking about arrow wise or, well, or what? Do you, I, your whole setup. So it, it's a Matthews V3, and I got a 28 and a half inch okay. draw, and I'm shooting 29 and a half inch arrows at okay. 74 pounds. Okay, and then what arrow system are you shooting? Uh, I'm kind of unfamiliar with the ones right now, I, or I shot them at TAC and that's the only time I used them. And this hunting season would be this time. But uh, what I was shooting was the full metal jacket, Easton. the, yep. yeah, the oh! five, five millimeters oh! and, uh, it's about 300 spines and about five twenty five grains, I, I think. Okay. And then, uh, this year I'm doing the Exodus MMTs with the 
three hundred spine as well. And uh, I think I think they're around four ninety grains or something like that. Mm -hmm. I know y'all have been messing with the Maros. I haven't messed with them yet. I would get some two fifties and just shit can a three hundred right off the bat, brother. <laughs> I got some two fifties. I wouldn't. I really wouldn't. I think you're going to be frustrated, and I'm going to tell you why. In the pursuit of adding four to center. One of the easiest things to do is to lower the shaft mass. So shoot, um, I traditionally shoot a 100 grain insert at a 200 grain point. That's my baseline. Now my big boy super adult arrows are 715 grains with 425 grain points that are awesome. But if I'm just farting around, I'm shooting a 250 spine with a 100 grain insert and 200 grain brought in. Okay, normal stuff, 640 grains somewhere in there. It shoots like a dog out of my boat. And I tried to shoot 300 spawn arrows to lower the shaft mass. Mm -hmm. yeah, lower range, range. It's like, it's like free four to center. And the reason why I wanted to do that is because Ed said the only factor of the 12 that gave equivalent penetration gains percentage wise was four to center. So every percentage higher of four to center you get, you gain some penetration. It may have been an inch. Remember you're shooting buffaloes. And I got to say this real fast. The reason why you shoot buffaloes is because they stop the arrows. You can't measure a pass through. You can't compare arrows if they all pass through. Okay. I tried to go to a 300 spine. I stood outside. I bear shafted them. I bear shafted a dozen. I knock tuned them. I put feathers on them because I like feathers and they're super light and they're awesome. And they will not fly broad in. Because they're too undersmined or what? They're just there on the edge. I put a 250 on and I can shoot at 60 yards and I can make a couple of mistakes. Like I don't need to have perfect form with a hat with a plumb bob hanging off of it, you know, and you got to test your nose on the left, not the right. You got to hold your and the, and the ducks got to fly over, and then you shoot, and then everything's fine. Mm -hmm. the The three hundreds would shoot, shoot, and then one would take off, and then shoot, shoot, and one would take off. And I almost went crazy because I I done everything like I did the whole ranch for everything. Like that guy's an idiot, but he has some good points out there, right? And it was purely spying. So if I was you, I'd call the boys over there and get some two fifties and just test them com together. And shoot broad hits. Field points are liars. Absolutely liars. I think you'll be better off. If they shoot the same, don't listen to me. It's fine. If the results show themselves to be accurate with 300s, I don't care. But there ain't no reason they can't send you a few errors. <laughs> and you check it. Just check it. Seriously. Check Just it. check it. Trust but verify. Yeah, I've I've seen a lot of the interesting stuff about um, the FOC. I haven't done uh, the calculations on what my arrows actually are, but I see a lot of folks that are anti FOC or not even anti FOC. They just don't care about it at all. And a lot of those folks that I've seen do it um, are, you know, a lot of the professional shooting crowd, and they're like pinpoint accurate on every single thing, and they're not worried about FOC. In in your mind, why what what is the what is the benefit from FOC? Is it just increased penetration? So, Aaron, I've learned this from the Rocket Man. He is a DOD scientist who made things, who shot things that went Mach five. Then they had better hit because it's sixty thousand dollars a shot to shoot a rail. Okay. So, aerodynamically, forward to center creates a more stable projectile. The point is pulling the shaft. So. The full metal jacket, which is the worst arrow system on the freaking earth <laughs> that's ever been made. Don't make Jake sad. <laughs> I mean, I'm not, I mean, out there, the worst. They micro bend. We already left that behind. They've got terrible inserts. The hit system is absolutely a disaster. I've got some great pictures. Oh, I can't show them to you of, of uh, broad heads like smashed this far back in a full metal jacket, just yep. all the way back. And that tulip, is true. tulip pedaling. Uh, the mm -hmm. full metal jackets, it's like a one-time use for sure. It's a one-time use, right. Yeah, I've always said that. So, current on a system that's, say, 10 or 12%, which is pretty normal, 125 grain point in a regular era. Mm -hmm. 
you're asking the nail to drive a drive. You're asking the nail to drive itself into the dirt, in, or asking a hammer to drive a nail. So if your nail's a little cattywampus when you hit it, it goes sideways because the arrows push in the point. Mm -hmm. Okay. If the arrow's pushing the point, and the arrow hits about like that. It's going to, uh, I'm going back to my camera. It's going to fly, it's going to hit, and the Ashley arrow is going to do that. Mm -hmm. Does not penetrate as far. It doesn't stay, it's hard to do this with the camera. Woo! Doesn't stay on the shot line, go straight and keep going. So, what the forward to center does, it creates an aerodynamically stable projectile. And I'm not going to go into all that because be that's another podcast. But when you have the point pulling the shaft, it wants to stay on the shot line. And that hap that seems to occur. Ed says around 19% forward center is where that started to manifest itself. Um, and that's probably on a 250 point arrow, that's probably 300 grains up front. So <laughs> you'll just get some magical stuff happen on arrows. Like you don't leave them in them. The arrows go through them and laugh. They just like, what? <laughs> I had one, uh, shoot, it's been years ago. It's probably 2018 or so. Mm -hmm. I had one, uh, it was a different bow. It was still a Matthews, but it was like the switchback. And oh, did you sell it? No, I still got it. Don't, if you sell it, you call me. Uh, <laughs> that's one I'm going to give one of like my kids okay. or something here that's in the next 15 years somebody, or so. Give it to me. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not selling that bow. I have uh, three of them and I've given them to my nephews. So yeah. they're still around. That's the best bow ever. Yeah, I, like, like it. <laughs> I liked it. I liked it. With that being said, like I was, I was only shooting like probably 55 pounds maybe with that thing. And it, it, the bow wasn't set up exactly for me. And heck, and it still it isn't. So it's probably like two inches uh, short on my draw length. Mm -hmm. But I couldn't even tell you what, what spine. It was probably like some 400 spine arrow or something I was shooting at the time. But it was my first public land buck. I had come out at like, I don't know, 25 yards or so. And I could have swore, like, if I was to put like a Sharpie where I wanted that arrow to go, it went there pr by probably pure luck. But it, the way the deer was positioned, it was kind of quartered away slightly. And so mm -hmm. when I put it right behind this shoulder, it stuck on the opposite shoulder. Okay. Is there anything with that setup that, that could have, I mean, I guess just put it bluntly, pop through that opposite side shoulder, kind of what you're saying. Would that heavy arrow fix problems like that, even though I'm only shooting 55 pounds? Yeah. We have ladies shooting Cape Buffalo with 55 pounds. And 750 grand arrows and going to the fletch on Cape Buffalo. We had a lady frontal. She shoots 55 pounds. That arrow is probably 800 grains, I think. Somewhere in there. She was practicing before she went Cape Buffalo hunting, so she went to a ranch here in Texas that had Asian buffaloes. They got the little short squatting horns, but they're still like 2,000 pounds. They're huge. Good God. She shot one frontal right there, and it hit the freaking femur. Or it hit the pelvis. <laughs> Seven feet of penetration. At 55 pounds. She shoots 55 pounds. 27 is strong. She's pretty tall. Yep. <laughs> See, I always now, thought... she had a two-blade broadhead that was absolutely stropped to perfection. She, the, the broadhead was one piece, machined, no give points, no bolts, no screws, no errors, and a street legal Ed, Ed arrow. So it had all of the components of what Ed found to be the highest penetrator. Your, your deer on a deer, to do what you want done, the highest percentage arrow for the hit that you're talking about on the opposite side to break through it, to possibly break through and keep going and zip on through is a single bevel broadhead somewhere over 600 grains and perfect arrow flight. Okay. So, so let's, let's take it to like the average deer hunter. Let's say they hunt public land. That would, I mean, just stick with my ignorance, but the higher grain, the heavier the arrow, correct? Yes, sir. So what do you have to say for those guys that, you know, public land is a little, you know, a little iffy at times. Like you 
you can only picture them coming in one way. And then, you know, uh, what is that? Murphy's law, something can go wrong. It will go wrong. Yeah. Uh, it comes in directly behind you or, or something along those lines. What I've noticed after switching. So shooting a very light arrow and then switching to the FMJs, which was a, probably a pretty good jump just in arrow yeah. weight. wise. Well, you definitely bumped it about 70 or 80 grains. What I noticed with, with that is if I was, 10 yards off, or I know that's a little extreme. If I was a few yards off, it seems like, or at least it felt like I could see that difference on where it hit. Cause like a lot of, a lot of times on public land or something, you know, you don't have a lot of time to, to range it. And this could even be on private too, a lot. Uh, you, you range it and then all of a sudden something happens, your release hits the stand, something along those lines. It kind of, something gets skittish. They take a few <laughs> leaps and bounds and all of a sudden instead of it, it being at 25, it's at, 34 and so you're trying to you don't have enough leeway for for error i should say with a heavier set of arrows so the lighter arrows don't give you but about four yards anyway if you really test it really 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 would just be go out and figure it out yourself go go to your target shoot your light arrows and back up five yards and hold the dead same aim for a miss right the miss you're talking about and see how low they hit okay now, I'm going to give this away. The deer could drop, and then you are freaking golden. That's true. Um, so there's a couple things there. I continue to be baffled by the new youngsters like yourselves with no wrinkles and stuff. Y'all fit for the tan. <laughs> that we are all rangefinder people, and we don't practice shooting random distance and eyeball on it anymore. When that's you know point. that's going to happen to you. Yep. People should just go shoot like we used to. We didn't have, I didn't have, I'm pre rangefinder. Pete, I'm pre RF. That's rangefinder too. <laughs> so that's really great. Um, so we had to learn to do that. And it's probably in your best interest to try that. Second is go out. I've got a whole video on this, but go to a 3D range, laser, and then walk back four yards and practice that. So if you do laser something and you have to spitball it, I don't care what arrow setup you're sitting, you're shooting, do that. Back up seven yards from known distance and learn to wing it. It's a little bit cheating because you did laser, but you might laser. And then the third thing is, and this is what I saw with the hunting public. The angles that you're going to get in public aren't always great. I would err on the possibility of being able to break things. Rather than say, I'm going to get a broadside shot and I'm going to misjudge the range by five yards. You're more likely to get a quartering two shot and that's it. Two openings happen to come from the wrong direction because of Murphy and they're quarter and two and then they're, that's it. That's your shot. Mm -hmm. So that's the side I are on. Having watched a lot of public, I, I've only hunted public once and, um, but talking to the hunting public guys, watching their videos, I'm more concerned about the shot angles than I am the distance deal. It's, and then God help the elk people. The Western guys give me this. I mean, they beat me to death over this stuff. And I watch, I don't watch much hunting videos. It's boring. But when you see elk called, they rarely walk in with their ass to the hunter. There's a lot of quartering two shots, you know? It definitely is. And the lethal part of the deer and elk still up front. That's true. It doesn't matter if they quarter two, aiming a little back and praying and spraying means you're going to walk along and gut you. That's just the way the physiology works. There's no debating that. People can say that, but it's not true. The lungs are like this. And when they quarter two, and you're shooting from, excuse me, let's see, stupid camera. Woo, woo, that way, okay, that way. And let's say you're over here. Uh, you're over, damn. Anyway, lungs go like that because they're quarter two. The arrow's gonna have to go through like that. And it's gonna travel, and that lung, let's see, is out of the way. They don't sit parallel, and then they quarter to the hunters up here, and the lungs go like that. 
So you're going to, if you shoot back, you're shooting by back in the lungs and it's going to go straight in the guts. Are you one of the, are you one of the guys that believes that like of, you hear a lot of folks. I mean, there's that there's, I feel like there's two camps. There's an anti shoulder shooter. There's guys that shoot two, three inches behind the shoulder because they have had a bad experience with that. Are you one of the folks that because they've got wingy arrows? Yeah, that's probably definitely it. Do you, if you're shooting a light setup and especially with an expandable, you better be back there. You better yeah, you see a lot of horror stories with that shoulder. Pray to God it opens. I hate, I think there's, there's nothing better than when they work and there's nothing worse than when they don't. When That's they work, true. When they work, it's unbelievable. I shot a black wildebeest in Africa in 2008. The guy gave me a rage and I said, if I lose it, you're buying it. He goes, you're not losing it. I'll pay for it. And I hit this thing right above the elbow, right in the center of the heart and blood shot out four feet. <laughs> and I thought it was the holy grail. <laughs> I found it. This I bought 700 packs of the damn things. The pigs thought they were freaking hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's we got awesome. a bunch of, I mean, we shot a couple that they ran off in the bushes and rodeo spin and knee high. There was blood everywhere. They were unbelievable. But the big ones, they just laugh at them and run off. And so, back to your question about the public thing and the brains and all that. I see more opportunities for bonks, which means that arrow stops, than I do for misjudging range. And that debate will never stop. So, yeah. And that's fine. Uh, I just, I, when I look at public hunting and the multiple angles that you're going to, like we're deer hunting at a deer feed, you just wait. Yeah. You turn both sides and bonk them. Like if you're going to shoot a crappy arrow system, a deer feed is a great place to do it because at least you can get them broadside and shoot them in the middle hope you can kill them but i'm a hundred percent shoulder shooter there is a hole that big in the vital knee where the humerus bone goes like this and the shoulder blades tilted up like that and then the humerus bone there's a hole in there this fist about the size of my face on a deer right there mm-hmm. there's nothing there it's rib cage except right behind it is the heart and the major vessels going across top of the heart and, and both major airways from the lungs. I mean, you shoot them right there in the final V. It's unbelievable what happens to them. So put their head down and they're gone. They're done. Yeah. So you, you say that, or now I'm totally agreeing with you, but a few years ago, I um, used to shoot a fixed, a fixed blade for, for no other reason than that's just what was laying around. Mm -hmm. But I picked up the whitetail specials and I shot one deer with those. And of course you make a good shot on one, kind of like what you were saying. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it zips uh -oh. right through and it's, it, it's beautiful. But, but before that, when, when we're on public and stuff, our mindset was, the Hunters Advantage podcast is powered by Out on a Limb Manufacturing. Out on a Limb is a family-owned company based right here in Oklahoma that makes tree stands, saddle platforms, climbing sticks, and so much more. Christian, I have a quick question. What's that? What bites sound harder, a hippo or an alligator? No idea. It's a trick question. The Ridge Runner 2.0 bites harder than both of them. But all jokes aside, we use these products all across the land on public or private. These help us get into any tree we want and hunt where the deer actually are. Most men go to the grocery store for their meat, but these products help you go to God's grocery store. I have used the Out on a Limb Ridge Runner 2.0 and the Shakar Sticks for the last few years hunting public land bucks, and I've actually shot several bucks out of this setup. If you want to support the podcast and get some Out on a Limb equipment, make sure to go to outonalimmfg.com and use code HNTA10 for 10% off at checkout. Once again, if you want to support the podcast, Go to outonalimmfg.com and use code HNTA10 at checkout for 10% off. Now let's get back to the podcast. We're going to switch to expandables because we want a bigger hole. That way it'll be easier to track because kind of where we hunt, it's like kind of there's these big old clear cuts that hadn't been touched in a while. And so it gets head high grass and stuff and, you know, from I don't know if it's just a marketing scheme or whatever, but it seemed like the expandables will cut a bigger hole, thus making it bleed a lot more. And then 
be a better blood trail. And then the, the fixed blades only kind of poke like a, I guess a little hole in it. And so, I mean, you kind of get where I, well, I guess what I'm trying to say yeah, is what were the results. I'm sorry. How many deer did y'all shoot? And what's your test? I mean, how did you verify it? Uh, probably like it, it was a, it was a very so, small, uh, study. That's the small sample say. size. Yep. Was there a massive blow on every one? No. Okay. No. I think you answered your own question. Okay. Trails are variable. <laughs> You're making me feel stupid. Down. Damn it. I get that question a lot. It's a yeah. great question. I wanted it answered. And mm -hmm. I always reply to people and some of the hate mail stuff is, if every of a hundred percent of the time that the blood trail was unbelievably fantastic, then I wouldn't change. Mm -hmm. But your how much blood did the deer that you shot when it stopped on the shoulder bleed? Uh, it didn't start bleeding until like a few hundred yards, and we just luckily stumbled upon some blood, and then we never found it. Yeah. Okay. So. That's probably a broadhead failure and a dulling of the broadhead that didn't get your deer. Mm -hmm. That's the same experience I had on the pigs, where it was just like, how the hell do you get half an arrow and hit them on the crease, the lower one third, and they don't just plunk over? Yeah, it makes mm -hmm. no sense. We track them for 200 yards, you know? And I, I, we really need somebody to, I don't think blood trails are controllable. I, I just, you know, all the data that I've got, when you hit them right to go 65 yards, is about the average distance. My average distance to blood is 40. And I think that's because the pigs run so fast. Right. Like they're yeah, playing animals right. in their heads. Like I think they think they're going to get eaten all the time, even when they're big. And when you shoot them, they all ask. Like I rarely have one just walk off. I've shot deer and shot through them and had them just kind of walk off and then fall over. But, but pigs are always booking it. So if the blood gets out, it's moving, that wind by it's moving pretty fast. And then usually it's about 35 yards to first blood. And then 35 yards beyond that, I got a pig and I hit them right. So, but that's with a system that's with a stropped head, you know, lots of things contribute to that and when guys started telling me this when i first started with the foundation i was just like come on man that's not been my experience it is now i literally shoot one look at the video back it up if it's in the vital e i go get them it sounds arrogant but they can't survive it it's yeah, not physiologically not possible but if the broadhead itself dulls bends, breaks off a blade, or the blades can't handle impact. So it's one of the biggest knocks on mechanicals is the approach angle of the blades is that. Eh, okay, I'll give them this. Like that, okay? This is not a broadhead. It's just, let's say the blades are like this, okay? Just this blade, and it's slamming into, it's hitting at an angle like that on the bone. Knives and stuff, I mean, when you cut a steak, do you slam the knife down on it or do you saw on it a little bit? I sound like a smart ass, but give it a little want, you want the approach angle to be more in a cutting direction so that when it hits lungs and arteries and veins, it just cuts them right off, right? But if the angle's more like this, you're slamming that cheap steel. A lot of, a lot of mechanicals are made with pretty cheap stainless. And so it just it has a blunting effect. And there's a lot of ribs. Last time you cleaned a deer, you know, there's eight or six or eight of them on each side. You know, just mathematically speaking. <laughs> so, and they're pretty flexible, right? So they, they're not going to cut in the sense of cleavering a bone. They don't work like that. They tend to, they tend to bend in which lengthens them a little bit and they hit more of the blade before they cut. Your chest wall is actually pretty flexible. If it wasn't, you'd die. You couldn't inhale and exhale. Mm -hmm. And so the mechanicals approach angle and lack of quality in the steel puts the blades at a very abrupt angle 
and it's, it's a sl- it's a popping motion. It's it's more of a slamming into things motion rather than a cutting motion. And if they dull on impact, they're dull going into the thorax, and your day is much longer. So yeah. I just I err on the side, lower one third, right up the leg, right above the elbow, kill them. On the kill them. <laughs> on the on the blood uh, the the blood trail front, I I always kind of try to take, keep in mind that no two shots that I've ever made are exactly the same, no. the exact same angle, the exact same placement. Every deer is a different size. Every deer has a different composition, fat. Yeah. I mean, every one of them are never the same. So you really can, I could have one, uh, one broadhead do incredible on one shot and shoot a different broadhead with the exact same shot. It might have a different, you, you just, you're never comparing apples to apples. So they were fair to say. For the Midwest guys, think about the difference in the hide on a summer deer and one in December. Mm-hmm. Then deer know the winter's coming. Or they, they die. The ones who don't die. So they yeah. get eliminated. <laughs> from the Put on those LBs. Right? And so you get this very thick hair, which is going to suck up blood. Pigs are terrible about that. Oh, yeah. Their hair is just nasty. It really soaks up the blood. That's why they don't really bleed a lot and are on the ground. And I bet that I've never put my hands on a Midwest whitetail in opening day versus December, but I've got to believe it's twice or three times as thick. I mean, I've handled livestock and stuff, so you can feel a difference on them. Our deer down here, I call them Jimmy Buffett deer at the ranch because they're always skinny and don't have any hair. That's pretty good. Yeah, right. Jimmy Buffett deer, they don't like the cold. At our place, if it gets below 40, go on about 10. (laughs) <laughs> yeah yeah they don't, they don't come out in the morning it's awesome but there's just a lot of things that are pretty logical i think that i get stupid mail on and people ask questions and stuff but if you just sit back and think about it you know like when i i'm still jake I, i'm still laughing about your face when i fletched the front of an arrow and said that's a fixed blade broadhead and you went holy crap i can see your face go that that idiot is right well, There's the thing is, nice up there, but it just was the way it was framed. Yeah. Right. So you could have them. The saddest thing is when people get a shot at a great big one, they are physically shooting at a very different animal than they are shooting does. It's just a more muscular animal. The bone structure is much heavier. Everything up front's thicker. And then let's say you're shooting a winner, it's got a big winter coat. And your broadhead, you know, three, two of the three blades dull, and you got one sharp one because the impact, impact it got eaten alive. Yeah, I was. I've shot a the last ten animals I've shot have been with like an NAP Thunderhead, hundred and twenty five mm-hmm. grain. Yeah. Um, I've got a lot of animals with that, but this last season I shot an opening day buck in Oklahoma. Ended up being two hundred and thirty pounds, like Sean Hoof, and yeah. he was a big, a big boy, biggest deer I've ever seen body wise, and mm-hmm. he was a. I would say pretty hard quartering away and I shot him with a fixed blade, not a thunderhead. It was with a, a thorn broadhead. It had like eight almost Perfect. small little blades. I think the total, the total was like a little over an inch. I hit him probably 30, 35 degrees quartering away. Pretty good right behind the shoulder. And it just zipped up the ribs. Never even went in the cavity, just yeah. dug in right in the pit in the shoulder behind the shoulder. Never yeah. even entered. Did the you lose it? Did you find it? No, thankfully he ran 20 yards, stopped again and I shot him again. Okay. Yeah. So that's a that's just a skip angle thing. So a lot of the broadheads with punch points and stuff have a bad, have a hard time with very hard quartering angles. Mechanicals are the worst because one of the blades opens up against the hide and the other one ain't open yet. Yeah. I mean, think about that, right? You got an approach angle like that, and here comes a mechanical. All the blades aren't going to deploy at the same time. So you got this thing opening and then opening and opening, and the arrow's just going to go like that, literally. The energy has nowhere else to go. So the minute that the broadhead starts to deploy and kick, the ass of the arrow is long, ton of leverage. And it just kicks to the side, and then the other blade opens, and it kicks to the side again and stops. But I'm not surprised that the thorn thing failed you on, you know, and skipped down the side of it. It's one of the things we're going to research more in the Ashton Foundation with, you know, skip angles is, is a really interesting dork kind of deal to do. Well, I've watched a, 
I've watched folks do some broadhead testing, which broadhead testing is always pretty interesting when they're shooting it through plywood or leather and stuff. But I've seen them shoot like plywood just at like 30 or 45 degree angles. And you'd be, I mean, it surprised me at least how many arrows were just blink, just right off. Didn't even yeah. dig in at all. It, it's a little bit, uh, it's, it's pretty suspect to shoot a homogeneous target because it doesn't really reflect reality, but it, it, if they skip off, you've got a, you've got a tough time shooting. Um, hang on, it's, it's texting me. Um, you got a tough time on the animals. It sucks. It, it really does. And some of the very short, um, single bevels and stuff aren't going to save you either. Cause they're, they get shorter. The, my head's relatively long. I tried to make it as long as I could in 200 grains. But when you start to go down to 150, 125, you start to open them up and they're going to have, they will have the same problems. There is no doubt. There's no doubt. And, so I assume your broadheads aren't, aren't mechanical then, huh? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> now I haven't seen, I haven't seen yours yet, but so is yours just a single bevel or is it, how's that look? So it's a single bevel broadhead. It's just, triangular shaped and then we have an optional bleed blade off that you can put on the back that we have 15 grains and then we have little collars you put behind your field points so that everything matches up mm -hmm. and they're real small and they're actually made out of pretty inexpensive steel they are intended to break we want the bleeder blades if they hit some hard enough the bleeder blades to stop to snap off and all the product to keep going so far we haven't had that happen the bleeder blades have held up very well they're pretty small I mean, they're not, I didn't make the bleeder blades equivalent to the size of the main blade, but you take that head, that style of head, just that shape, whatever brand you choose to get, mm -hmm. learn to sharpen a little bit. I just did a video um, on a tool from the company called WorkSharp. It's a thing called Precision Adjust, and it's literally the best broadhead sharpener I've ever used. It's a knife sharpener. And this is five and a half years later. I've been sharpening broadheads by hand for a long time and stropping and all that stuff. And I found this thing. It was just like, holy crap, that thing's awesome. And the, the really the goal of the thing is going back to like the inserts and it, all that is I wanted to build a broadhead. There's a lot of that style. This is not its own category. It's got a lot of features and a lot of other broadheads that are fantastic. So there's a ton of good single bevel broadheads out there. But no tip bends, no breaks, doesn't stop, and doesn't, it'll go right through a bone. It'll snap a bone, it'll snap bones like, it'll just rotate and pop the bone and keep going. They're I didn't, I didn't uh, wasn't like a huge fan of the single bell for a, a long time, and I went and tracked a doe one time with my buddy Drew, and he shot it real low, like probably an inch above just the bottom of the stomach, and but, you know, real close to the heart. And when he, when we picked the dough up, the leg went limp and just started rotating like a, mm -hmm. and he had taken that leg bone, which was fairly thick on this dough. And it. Just, it went through and just broke it in half, like clean mm -hmm. cut too, in the bone was just clean. Yeah. looked like somebody saw it. And I it's was real like, common for humerus is actually for them to shatter. Yeah. It's real common for them not to cut. It's the rotate, it hits them, they rotate and the bone will actually fragment and it just blows a huge hole in them and keeps them going. I mean, you don't try to hit bones. I've been accused of that a lot, that I'm like, I want you to hit a bone. No, I don't. I want you to hit a, I want you to shoot an arrow system that's capable of doing what it has to do, should it hit a bone. Should you misjudge the range and hit a little low, your, your mechanical broadhead is going to freaking stop. I'm sorry. Yeah. So, if you misjudge the range, back to the misjudge the range conversation, if you misjudge the range with a super fast arrow, which is totally practical and it's just that much further or whatever, and you hit low, you have no chance. You have a very low chance because the blades are going to open up, point's going to hit, blades are going to go like this, and it's just going to cap. I mean, it's just, how's a bone going to break if it's got, you know, two blades like that trying to go through it? What but, do you think of those of those hybrid uh, broadheads? Uh, have you ever heard of the fixed expandables? Yeah, I have, and they're gonna have the same problems. Same problem. The, the I would put the damn main blade online with the 
I'd make them an inch and an eighth wider with a mechanical blade behind them. I'd oh, well. hole in them and then the blades come in behind it, but I don't, I don't know that that exists. Are, yeah. I thought I I'd saw some arrows that had like you put your broadhead on the front and there was like two blades on the arrow. Oh yeah, we shot that. The whole damn thing exploded. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, we shot that. The guy was the guy had all this research research he'd done and yeah. we got it and we shot it out of some stuff and the whole the, it was like a piece you you screwed in it was about this long it had blades behind it you could put whatever fixed blade you want in front. Mm -hmm. It exploded at like nine hundred pieces. We that's weren't nice. wearing safety glasses. That's how bad it was. Oh, we no. were like, oh, and I'm pretty stupid. And even I said, man, we should have had safety glasses on that one. <laughs> you know, so yeah, it's awesome. really, there's no fast answer. Mm -hmm. You need to be shooting them where they die. And your arrow system can't fail. It's really that simple. And if you're shooting mechanicals and they don't fail, they're freaking great. I mean, they're great. But I'm just not that good. I mean, that's another thing I wanted to touch on. I've had some, some of them, a couple of pros and some people who are world renowned guys who sold archery companies and hunted all over the world. They've got the North American sheep, sheep's lamb, that kind of thing. Some people who are really good shooters say that, you know, take chip shots at me. I don't give a hoot in hell about the 1% good the best people on earth yeah it, that's not everybody so some of these guys come at me and say stupid stuff and i'm like okay you're the you are i can't out shoot you i got that so what about how are you helping average people instead of going look i can do it i don't care yeah. about that i'm trying to help somebody who's a brain surgeon and you get brain cancer and you want that guy cutting on your ass to be able to kill a deer. And he's not that good at shooting a bow. Mm -hmm. Like everybody's got skill sets in this deal. Mm -hmm. So we've got accountants and mechanics and freaking HVAC guys, you know, surgeons and, you know, good finance people and all that stuff. That's their, that's where they excel. So the top 1% of spot shooters and five spot shooters, they can do whatever they want. It's fine. You're not normal. I think I'm the only person on earth who will admit that. Oh, They're yeah, I'm not leaving them already. <laughs> bow shooters. How are they helping anyone? How? By saying, that's the dumbest thing ever. I, it never happens to me. Probably not. Under stress, the bull elk at 17, somehow you go into the zone. And you just shoot straight. That's not everybody. My, my second child... Caleb can throw backflips on a bike and land backwards. <laughs> so he does a backflip, half a turn, and rolls it and lands on the tires and goes backwards on his bicycle. Hmm. It sounds like a medical bill. No. Well, he just blew his ACL, but that was on, on doing <laughs> completely unrelated. <laughs> well, he had, before that, he never really hurt himself. He does the same thing on a scooter, right? And they, they call that air awareness. So those people like gymnasts and stuff, everything slows down. Mm. He says, I see everything. I throw it. I'm, you know, he's in a concrete half pipe, comes out of the pipe. He said, I see the birds and my brain's going, okay, you got to do this and that and this and that and land backwards and roll it out. That's what he's good at. That's one of the things he's good at, right? So the top bow shooters in the world, okay, you win. I'm not here to fight with you guys. I'm here to help the other people who are kick-ass or whatever they do to make this world spin around better than everybody else. Kill a damn deer. Right. And that, that's always been <laughs> entertaining to me that I'm really trying to help people. The, the hardest thing about it is the physiology doesn't move around. Mm-hmm. Quarter and two, quarter and away, the physiology is the physiology. It's still lower one third, preferably on the crease or in front of it. That is where the vitals are. There's I no change. Mouse to elephant. They're all the same. 
I listened to a podcast the other day um, with a, it was a surgeon and his son was a Botech and he had him on talking about what actually kills animals, talking about mm -hmm. lungs and hearts and all these things. And uh, he was like, yeah, if you, you know, if you shoot a field point through both lungs, like you're going to, the blood trail might not be good, but you're going to find the deer because you're deflating, you're deflating that and mm -hmm. um, taking that vacuum out or whatever. But similar to what you're saying with the best guys in the world, the best guys in the world could kill them with a field point. If they hit them in the exact right, right spot and get a little bit of penetration, they're going to get them. But I just don't think that's most people. No, it's not. It's not. It's not me. Most, the way I, I can tip from what I can tell from email, I get a thousand messages a month, by the way, between May and October. So I talk to a few people, mostly bow tuning, arrow tuning, blah, 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 how to sharpen stuff. I bet the average person gets to hunt 10 times a year, 10, 10 hunts. Seriously. Some of us are lucky and have ranches and access and stuff like that. But if you're swinging in a tree doing public and you got two kids, you're not hunting 10 weeks, two, 17 days straight. You're not. You're not. It just doesn't happen. Life gets in the way. Stupid job gets in the way, right? And then those annoying kids because you had unprotected sex and you were successful at it. <laughs> <laughs> so now you can't go deer hunting. <laughs> uh, that's awesome. I did that. I've only had sex four times and three times I was successful. So <laughs> <laughs> 75 percent batting average. Women walk way around me. They don't have uh, any fifty. I'm freaking lethal. Right. <laughs> That's awesome. So but honestly, people don't get to hunt as much as everybody acts like they do. Yeah. And when you get your chance, you get your one shot a year, a lot of places one tag, right? I would hope that you can cheat where you have to or pass. I'm okay with you saying my arrow system is not adequate. Aaron Moore Britton and I had a long discussion about this. He videoed for some big whitetail channel before he became the hunting public, and all of them did. Yeah, Midwest Whitetail, I think yeah. it was. Oh, okay. And he said, I saw so many deer with half an arrow in them on quarter and two shots or bad results. I had a bull elk at 10 yards. This was like 2012. And he said, I can't shoot. Like he had so many shots in his head. He said, I literally drew the bow and my head's going through all the stuff he's seen. Mm -hmm. He did not shoot 10 yards in a bull elk quarter and two. Because he knew his chances of success were very, very low. Yeah. Now, with what he's shooting now, nope. He shot. Well, I seen him. He shot completely through a well. That's what I was about to say. I seen Nate a video on, on their channel. He hit one frontal, and I think it came out the butt end. It did. It, it completely passed through the bull, lengthwise. That's a lot to get through. That's impressive. Yeah. Right. We just did an interesting test because he hit one earlier in that hunt, and it hit a limb, and it hit it and stopped. And but he hit a pretty good size stick, and arrow just freaking went sideways. Right? We just did a test shooting through bushes and stuff, and grass and like leafy, softer stuff didn't really. We couldn't see the target. Like we were guessing. Like we put a stick in the in there and say, hey, <laughs> and sh that's how much stuff we were shooting through. But we got up to this woody plant. It was about the size of my pinky, but it was woody. It was stiff, and you should have seen the arrows just. Mechanicals fixed, single bevel didn't matter. They were just wham. I mean, there a, a video will come up probably in the next few days on that. We did a long deal on that, but that's what happened to him on that one bowl was he tried to squeeze it through, which everybody's going to do, and it's not going to work. And that's fine. Keep shooting. I'm on the air. You can't kill him. Ain't shooting, and shit's going to happen. It's going to happen. You're going if you keep hunting, you're going to lose them. I don't care if you shoot 900 grains in a perfect era. You're going to lose one every once in a while. It's just part of it. If you, if you don't think so, yeah, keep doing it. <laughs> yeah, for real. I've lost a few. I I remember a time, uh, I think it was two years ago, where um, I used to be pretty interested in like speed in my bow. Like I, I wanted something that, that shot Dude, We all did it. We all yeah. did it. I'm not the only knucklehead out there who's shooting logs. Listen, I spent a lot of years trying to go fast. Well, I, uh, I shot my bow through a chrono and I was shooting, I have a, right now I'm shooting a 500 and 
45 grain arrow. Yeah, there you go. You're, all, you're, you're there. Yeah, getting close. Um, and I shot it to the chrono, and it was shooting like 261 or something. And I got genuinely discouraged that season because I was like, oh, my, I'm not going to. I'm not, my arrows going to be fast enough, but I was sticking, sticking arrows through animals and sticking them in the dirt. You have a really good saying that I, I made a lot of sense. and kind of resonated with me. You said you're not building an arrow to get to an animal. You're building one to get through it. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, that's the biggest disconnect with me and the foundation. Really? We want to know what the buffalo does to the arrow. We want to know what the buffalo does to the arrow. We don't want to know what the arrow does to the buffalo. Mm -hmm. And that's a completely different mindset. When you start studying what your arrow looks like after the animal did whatever it did to it. As opposed to just getting it there. Yeah. In the defense of the industry, which I'm no fan of, and they are sure as hell don't like me. <laughs> um, the best guys in the world are target guys. Tell me one person. Haynes may be the only guy who's just kind of a fitness dude who fell into the hunting thing. Chalky bow hunts, but not a lot. Meat eater guys don't count because they do everything. I'm not trying to get them out of the conversation, but they're just kind of, that's a bad brand. It's not bow hunting. It's everything. Tell me another guy in the pro guys who made, who actually make a living bow hunting who didn't shoot target archery. I don't know it. I'm not trying to challenge you. I don't yep. know them, but I know five or six names that rattle around in my head. They're all spot shooters or 3D guys. 100%. Yeah. The best guys in the world. The best guys in the world. Right. Yeah. And then they, then they make this transition to become bow hunters and they're freaking experts in all this crap. They're not. Nitwits. No one have a freaking clue what's going on. They do get to hunt a lot and kill a lot of stuff, but they don't know yeah. why. They don't know why. And so they're kick ass at getting it there. Their mental acuity is higher. We already talked about that. I wore that out earlier. They're better than we are at shooting the bow. Absolutely. At getting it there. Nobody, they don't tell us how many they lost. No, that's fair. It, it's kind of interesting when you got sponsors on the show. And I mean, I like to, if we shoot one and we don't find it, I'm like, well, it ain't doing me any good not to show it. Like whatever it happens. Um, yeah. Right. No, that's, that's absolutely fair. Right. Yeah. But we don't know how many they lost. I saw somebody sent me a clip on one of the guys shooting 120 yards or something. I think it was an all that. It's far enough that the camera wasn't real good on it. And they said, wow, 120 yard shot. And all I saw was the animal sitting there. Here comes the arrow. And right about here, I saw the arrow. I saw the animal move. And I went, okay, where's the hero shot? Because it was on target until the animal just decided to fart and walk a step and a half. Because it's so far, it takes a long time to get there. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, not really concerning to me as much as you've got to, you, you really got to be thinking about what the buffalo does there. You got to be looking at your broadheads. The next time you kill a deer, the first thing you should do when you shoot, as opposed to look at blood and jump around like a Kansas City faggot, you should probably, <laughs> that's the Blazing Saddles, by the way, gonna, that movie will not be around soon. You boys need to see the Blazing Saddles before they ban it because it's all the great stuff. But anyway, you need to look at your arrow system and see if it's all chewed up or bent or anything. Is there anything broke? Is Are the blades destroyed? Now, if it hits rocks and stuff, okay, throw that out. If you shoot it and it kind of didn't hit anything weird or just went through them and just kind of fell out, if you see two blades on a three-blade broadhead that are mangled, the next one's not going to – there's going to be one that that's going to cost your ass. That's true. No, I promise you I know from doing it. I know from doing it myself that, man, I used to shoot a lot of muzzies and the blades were always mangled. And I didn't connect the dots on that thing. And I had a couple go wonky. And I wonder, I got to be looking back now and thinking, you know, I wonder if them blades were tore up and there was one blade going through them that was sharp from down to 30%. You just took an arrow that was an A-OK -okay arrow to a D. 
Aaron Snyder and I talked about this, and this is all him. His idea is the idea of an A plus arrow could go down to B minus. But if you start at a B, B arrow and it goes to a D, you're really going to be hurt. And I think it's a great analogy. So, oh, that was totally his deal when we were talking about it was on his podcast. The idea that if you just you get an arrow that's pretty okay and work in a pretty, in the best situation, the highest percentage hit, you're going to be fine. But when things go a little weird, it really rose fast. So, so you said that fixed, you know, obviously mechanicals are not a risk that you're willing to take. And it sounds like there's most of the fixed blades you're not a fan of either. What, what are, what is your system? What will you, um, what's acceptable for you in terms of a broadhead to shoot? Is it just the soft metals? I just, uh, it's really the cut on contact thing. So Magnus is one of my sponsors. I love Mike Song. He's one of the best people in the business there around 30 years. He's just a great guy. And he's one of the most honest people I've ever worked with on anything. His stuff is phenomenal, for the, especially at the price point. There's no way, and he'll tell you this, it ain't a raspberry broadhead that's a single double made out of a machine, machined out of steel. It is not. But at that price point, that, that black hornet that he's got, I call it the foamer. Because when you shoot them, it makes foam. Like, <laughs> it's, it's nasty. <laughs> he sent me that thing about five or six years ago when I first started out. I met him somewhere. He said, I got a broadhead. I want you to try it. I said, right, sends it to me. It's short and blunt. Got these crazy, stupid angles. I already talked about that. Right? like that was a bad thing, right? And the bleeder blades are kind of these spikes that he stick out the side. Weird looking. I said, God, I hate this thing. I shot three pigs with it. There was foam. <laughs> It was unbelievable what they do. Now that is not a bone, that's not a quartering to bone impact, known bone impact shot brought in. And he'll tell you that too. It is not. If you get a hard quartering two and you say, I am going into the vital lead, I am shooting for the lead, most lethal spot and there's going to be an elbow in the way and I'm going to turn it loose, that's not the brought in. It didn't. But for Normal shot angles, quarter away, broadside, a little bit on quarter and two, a little bit of scapula. Those things are badass. They'll do the work. And so anything, I, I prefer cut on contact heads if you're not going to go single bone. because it's, When you go into the one piece world, you have to become an adult and learn to sharpen and cut. A lot of people don't want to do that. So a good replaceable blade cut on contact option is... That's why I'll never give up. When, if I disappear, then that'll be that. But if I'm still in the bowing business, I'm always going to keep Magnus around. If I can get you to go from anything with a pyramid, punch point, something like that, that's got a lot of resistance to something that just cuts its way in, you're going to see it. It's phenomenal. It's, it's just a different, it's a different ballgame, completely different ballgame. Yeah, there, there was a situation last year where I was hunting on public and I, I was try using a mix of fixed and expandables and I had yep. expandables in my quiver too. And I, I had one on my, you know, in my, uh, on my bow and I was, a I had a good buck come in on public and he was quartering to me pretty good. And I remember getting in full draw on him and him sitting there quartering to me probably 20 degrees. And I was just like, no, this isn't going to work. How far was the shot? Tw 20 yards. Right. The one thing about the misjudging range thing, Jake, I'm not trying to beat you over the head with this. Oh, no, please. please, please <laughs> this do. is a thing that comes up a lot in the public discussion. Your question was totally valid. Mm -hmm. I get this bullshit 40-yard stuff. What if it's at 40? And then I talk to you guys and you're shooting 26 yards all the time. And you said it. Awesome. You just said it. The honey public guys won't shoot 30 because they're deer jump. They just think it's too risky. Yeah. But – um I think that's practical, but I, I talked to the hunting guys and I've actually had email exchanges with people who are kind of trying to whip on me a little bit about shooting far. And I say, what's your average shot distance? Tell me the last five deer you killed. 17, 19, 22, 21. Okay. Why are we talking? Why are we, you could shoot a 900 grain arrow that far. You could. Yeah. Did you, did you shoot or not? No, I didn't. Smart. I, I, well, I was sitting, yeah, and I was sitting there with my wife, and I was like, uh, "I'm not going to sit here for the next two days looking for this deer because I know I'm not going to. It's not going to go in there, and if it is, it's going to zip back to the guts, and it's not going to be a good situation." And so I was like, "Ah, no." No, you, you did the you did the right thing. You did the right thing. 
It's okay. I don't think I would have thought of it. I don't. I do not think I would have second guessed it if I if I had confidence in the in that arrow and what I was shooting on the front. I really think with the fixed blade, I, I would have shot him. I think with a six hundred grain arrow with a single bow, where you'd have it would have gone. The sound is is phenomenal when you hit the court right here. It goes chut. <laughs> it makes this tiny sound. It, so, it doesn't make any sound. It's the weirdest. You hear chut. And it just keeps going. So, War Britain cut. That deer he killed was probably a 220 pound deer. It's a big 10 point. I bet it's a 160 inch deer. This is a Midwest deer. He cut the humerus ball in half at 20 yards and it hit a stick on the way in. I remember that hunt. Yeah, that was. I did a full. He sent me the necropsy videos because you get demonetized for showing blood and all that stuff. I get demonetized every time I do a necropsy, but it's good. It's valuable for the bowling world. I don't care. And so he sent me the clips on it, but he hit the ball, the humor, the worst bone up front you could possibly hit, and it cut it like a lemon in half. It was split down the center. The broadhead hit this shoulder blade, stopped, but it went right through the heart. And he sent me the video. I was sitting here working or something. A video comes up. And he said, what do you think? When I said, who shot that deer? He said, I shot that deer 30 seconds ago. Everybody says it's a one longer. I said, Aaron, what I saw, and this is cool with you guys in that video. If you shoot one kind of forward, watch the shaft. And if it goes like this and stays with the deer, it's in him. Mm -hmm. If it's waving... It's this far in because the front's not anchored. Yep. But what I saw was the deer ducked a little bit and then the shaft, the deer kind of jumped and rolled and the shaft just went like this with the deer. And I said, it's anchored on the other side. He's 60 yards away. And he said, everybody thinks it's um, one motor. I got a dog coming. I said, fine. I mean, maybe I'm wrong. Right. I'm so in the video, you see the lady come out with the dog. They get up on top. They're on top of a hill. And the wind's blowing up. I know what you're talking about now. And the dog yeah. goes like this. I'm watching the dog. And the dog goes like that. Like, God. And it's like 55 or 70 yards. Any other platform. So he shoots 640 grains. He shoots a single level broadhead. He does tune pretty. He's pretty, pretty, pretty tight on the tuning stuff. Without that whole package. The results are unknown, but it's a lower percentage chance. It is possible you break it. It is possible. It just lowers the chances for everything to change. And he had 11 of the 12 factors, so he did not have a tapered arrow, but he had everything else. He's learned to sharpen. He's learned to strop. He's pretty fastidious on that stuff. And they, they, every pig they shot this week was, I think Hayden shot a pig at 10 yards. The arrow went 50 yards past it. <laughs> Zip through. I mean, it wasn't even funny how fast it went through it. There was all pass-throughs, all in the dirt. And, and pass-throughs, like, they're not there. Like, the arrow's just, you know. That's so how, you know, is, is, is 40 or 50 yards kind of unethical then for, like, that heavy of an arrow? Because if it's going slower – then the deer has more time to react. I know it's just minuscule, but I guess the reason I ask that is because I, I hunt some private as well. And obviously, you know, everybody wants that 20, 30 yard shot. Well, my private, and I know everybody probably says this too, the deer, I swear to God, have schizophrenia. <laughs> and so with that being said, like I have two feeders on two different areas and I set them 40 yards away from my stand like mm -hmm. minimum 40 yards because mm -hmm. anything closer, you know, you, you got those, those groups of does that come in, you know, there, there could be five to seven of them at one time and one head goes down, the other one pops up. And we just talked to a guy, uh, I forget his name on the deer science month. He was talking about deer vision and deer, when they actually lower their heads, their eyeballs, some house, I don't know the way he worded it, they adjust. And so they see just as good with their head down like on a level playing field than they would straight up. And, oh, shoot, where was I going with this? Uh, the, the the heavy arrow thing. Yeah, you're uh, worried about being able to hit them because they'll jump out of the way. Kind of, yeah. 
Yeah. And I know that sounds unethical, but that's literally my only option without getting busted and picked off. So I did a video on this and I looked at like seven or eight different clips I found on YouTube or whatever of different aero systems and the, the amount of jump, the direction they went, et cetera, was completely unpredictable. So the general idea is that they go this way. Mm -hmm. Generally, actually, they go down and away from you. Yeah. They're, they're, they're running away. They're not dropping because they know. They don't watch YouTube. So they're not saying, I'm ducking. They're leaving. Mm -hmm. so they tend to roll away. <clears throat> so there's two trains of thought on that. But the faster arrow will get there in a hurry and hit them. Okay. So Christians, we've watched enough. You, you snorted enough fairy dust. You know, that <laughs> I don't give a hoot about getting it there. I care about getting it through all. So if you have an inadequate arrow system to hit whatever you've now introduced into the shot line because the animal has changed its physical presence as the arrow approaches and starts to roll, will it break when it hits? That is assumed. So you know I are on the side of shatter everything it hits. Because if you spiral it and cut their spine completely in half, they are not leaving. If it hits it, hits the shoulder blade and stops, then you hit them, right? The second thing is the downrange energy massively reduces on the light stuff due to aerodynamic drag. That is not refutable. We've shot it through a lab radar. All you do is run the, you run the speed and you run the kinetic energy as the arrow goes down range. So a key component of kinetic energy is velocity squared, okay? But lighter arrows slow down faster than heavy ones do. They may not launch as fast, but the heavy ones don't slow down as fast because they're massive and they push against the atmosphere harder and don't drag as much. So at 40 yards, you may launch with the same kinetic energy as a 600 grain arrow. By the way, bows are constant kinetic energy. We'll do another podcast on that. <laughs> At launch, for constant kinetic energy. But when it gets to 40, the lighter arrows slow down so much faster that the delivered on target energy is reduced. At 40 yards, 60. At 60 yards, we did it at 60. So the momentum of a 514 grain arrow at 60 yards was higher than the launch momentum of 388. The impact energy for 514 was higher at 60 than it was at the bow for a 388 grain arrow. How, how is that? Because I mean, the never leaves. Speed is constantly eroding. Heavy never stops being heavy. That, that'll kind of bottle your mind because I've sat there and thought about that before. And that's what the bow techs were assuring me of when I went down to like 260 FPS out of the bow. And they were like, yeah, but this, this arrow is not going to slow down nearly as fast or decelerate no, as fast. Down. Down. Because the, the atmosphere is a constant. So you need to be thinking about the atmosphere is fog that you're shooting through and it has some mass and it's pushing back. It's 14.7 PSI, way too much information. It's pushing against the arrow. A very heavy object pushes harder against the atmosphere that is constant. The atmosphere is constant than a lighter projectile, pushing against exactly the same amount of pressure at sea level, which is 14.7 psi. So the heavier object has the ability, because it isn't ever lighter, but every arrow is always slowing down. So at impact, that heavy stuff is hard to stop. Now, you put a mechanical on that heavy arrow and shoot 40 yards, you've got your, it's a shit show. Because you've now taken all the energy that you gained in the mass and deployed it into this system that just explodes open and sucks all the energy out of it. That is not ideal. 
my biggest concern is shooting four and having them jump is breaking and stuff. The fast guys are going to get there faster, half a millisecond. It's nothing. What's in the way? Yeah. If yeah. they stood still, like bull elk and stuff, don't really jump. Yeah, big I animals. Think that, no. I think that's pretty logical. And even mule deer don't tend to bounce much, but whitetails. And I actually moved our deer feeders into. I try to get them. I got a couple at twenty five just because the setups don't set up for closer. But where I could get them to fifteen. Brother, the lethality has gone through the roof at 15. When they were at 20, five yards further, we had a harder time killing them because they could jump that much more. So your two problems are energy at impact and what's in the way. Because you're telling me, and Jake, I'm not beating on your head. I'm saying this. No, no, you're good. The audience is saying, and the message board idiots sitting in their mother's basement yelling for a pizza in their underwear. <laughs> Mom bathroom. Mom Cheeto fingers. Pizza, I'm yelling at the ranch fair. <laughs> um, what's a ranch fair? So um, they're saying <laughs> they are admitting the animal's going to move. In this yeah. scenario that you've given, it's a wonderful one. Mm. You are saying most of the time my, arrow, my deer are on point. I got nine deer in front of me, two of them's heads up. The deer's going to move. What's in the way now? What's going to be in the way? And how are you getting through that? Because you've already admitted, once again, this is for the audience. You've already admitted the animal's going to move. Right. What's in the way? Everything. Will the, will the arrow system have a chance? That's a good point. It's, I mean. It's something to lay in bed and think about. Yeah, uh, because they're going to move either way. And kind of like you said, the, the difference is minuscule, whether, you know, regardless of the. I guess the setup. So once it gets there, I mean, you're right. You're right. I mean, I was, I was super worried coming into this because I was like, Hey, I don't know anything about, Good. about arrows or anything like that. But the way you've been explaining it, how the broadhead, you know, pulls. Ver- just the at- is, is really, you know, yeah. to, just reframe that there's more mass on the front as it's pulling. It's just physics. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That's what I'm right. trying to say. It There's has to be a heavy so much the process. It's the mass that does that one. Just so you yeah. Know. Okay. 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 Yeah, but uh, no, it is it is something to think about, and I'm I've listened to like probably four podcasts uh, of you just trying to where I could halfway be competent with the conversation, and I feel like I'm doing a terrible job at that, anyways. But no, you're, you're actually you've actually been quite refreshing because you're asking a lot of the questions that are you're very you're you're brutally honest. It's really good. Well, if I was you, I would get whatever these arrows you're going to shoot. I go get some 200 grand points and shoot them. Okay. Well, don't change the don't change the inserts. Don't don't get too stupid. Right. Just put some 200 grand points on the chrome. Okay. Well, get your arrow mass somewhere around 520. You know, you're going to be. I don't know. You'll be 75 grand. How are you shooting 100 grand points or 125s now? The they those were 125s, I believe. Okay, so. You'll probably be what you said four ninety, so you're gonna be a five and a half, five fifty. Ooh, brother. Is that a sweet spot? That's the first arrow I ever built where I went, what the hell just happened? Because I shot two <laughs> pigs and it went like whoo, like they it. weren't there. It's like I was just shooting my bow at the ground. Mm-hmm. They're having to be a pig in a way. Well, that's it's kind of funny you say that because I was using it was two years ago, I was using the FMJs and then uh, I had the white tail specials on 125 grains. And I shot a deer with that, I think that year, and of course, perfect shot. So it zips through. But, and I'm not saying I'm a good archer because I missed two last year, but I just got lucky on that one. But when we hunt a public, there's a whole bunch of pigs that come through, and pigs are kind of like coyotes around here. Like it's almost the yeah, same if you don't try to sling an arrow at them. Mm-hmm. And I've never, I've never killed a pig where I found it because. I shot two and each time, like it wasn't a shoulder hit. It was just damn near center mass. If I'm being completely honest uh-huh. and there wasn't a pass through and I never found it. And there goes $40 worth of arrow right yeah, there right. each time. Right. right. And now, I mean, it, 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 the way you've been explaining it, it all adds up uh, and like into what's going wrong with each setup because there shouldn't be a reason why I shouldn't get through that pig to be honest. Cause I'm shooting 74 pounds at a 20, 29 and a half, uh, draw length and then 
my arrows at the time were 525. So, I mean, there's right, well, something you wrong. A massive, uh, you had a massive energy heater in the mechanical. So mm -hmm. I did a video on this too. And I actually looked at the recommended kinetic energy for mechanical broadheads. And it was somewhere around 50 pounds of kinetic energy was recommended. So this right. is going to make your head spin again, Jake. So you're going to sleep up at night. So you can t email me anytime. And I'll, <laughs> I'll help you. All righty. If they are correct, and let's say that 50 pounds, there's no research on this, by the way. I've not seen anyone research this to confirm how they got 50 pounds of kinetic energy. I don't know. I'm not bashing them. I'm just saying I don't see any research saying 50 is the number. I think it's way more than that. Because of seeing what you experience and other shooters. Because when I watch videos, I just go to the shot. I don't give a crap. I, don't right. care, right? I just want to see the shot. You nice, you might nice people. Oh, wow, you freaking got half an arrow. <laughs> if 50 is the number, that's what you, that is what's required to make the thing work. Your bow, Jake, is probably launching about 80 foot pounds at the bow. You leave, you are leaving the truck with only 30 pounds of kinetic energy to help you should something go wrong. Think about that. It's backwards thinking. Mm -hmm. You walk in a store, they scan your broadhead and they took 50 pounds of kinetic energy out of your system and threw it in the trash. And you leave the truck with 30 because 50 is going to get eaten on impact. When it was shooting 80. Right. Correct. And you only have that's three. Wild. I mean, just think, put that yeah. in. There. That's not my, I'm not knocking them. And I'm not saying I know the answer. I took their data. Mm -hmm. I screenshotted their websites, four or five, uh, three of them. And said, I've got the math on the KE. Shot through a lab radar. Lab radars don't lie. They just do their dumb job. You shoot and it says, this is the numbers. So you scan and 50 pounds of kinetic energy, you just throw it in the trash and you are now hunting with 30 pounds of kinetic energy. Because that's, that's, how you, that's all the extra you got. That's what you got to keep going. That's wild. And if you go check, you can fact check me on this. Read the websites. It doesn't say you're going to pass through with 50. It just says we recommend 50 or 55. It doesn't mm -hmm. say That'll be a pass through. It'll get 10 inches of penetration, et cetera. So it's well, a it's, negative yeah. thing. Once again, I'm not bashing on them. That's their own literature. Mm -hmm. And you're launching around 80 because my bow is 65 to 28 and a half. And my bow launches in the mid 70s. So you're a little longer than I am. So you've got more time on the string. And so you're, we'll just call it 80. So you got 30 pounds of kinetic energy to do more work after an impact. And a, and again, excuse my ignorance, I know, but, and then a fixed blade, that doesn't take anything away? We don't know that answer. So mm -hmm. that's the fair answer. All we know is they tend to zip on through. They tend to really go whipping through. Okay. So they post something that's unfounded. And we don't know. We're me and the rocket man are trying to measure exit velocity on a thorax. So go down to the ranch, get a gun, blast the pig, cut the shoot, cut the chest wall off, shoot it. We know what the impact KE is. We can do that really easy. Twenty yards times speed times v squared, blah blah blah, and then catch it leaving. That's hard because lab radars don't work perpendicular. You got to shoot down, down the shot line, and the lab radar catches it like that. If you put the lab radar this way, going by it doesn't do it. It's like it's not like I need a cop. With a really slow. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's so good. then if we could do that, we could measure how much K is actually being eaten up. And you could actually verify and hit a rib, you know, cut a rib in half, center the rib, put a scapula up there with meat on it, come out the back. Mm -hmm. But um, I can tell you this, I shot a 650 grand arrow with my broadhead and the, Six times into a pig's skull, 
And the only uh, two, uh, three of them wouldn't have stopped. We had a target behind it because I didn't want, I don't want the, I was trying to break the broadhead. So I, you can't have the broadhead leave and skip off the ground and hit something because then it's, the results are no good. You want to just see what the pig did to the broadhead. Right. Three of them would have passed through. I shot That's it cool. laying down right here and it went out the top of its head and the fletchings were in his brain. That's nuts. Oh, it's super, yeah. it's super fun. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Magnus is coming out with a new broadhead. It'll be out in the next couple of, probably next two months or so. And I was the beta, a beta tester for him. And we did that and just, they would kill the pig and shot it three times in the side of the head and then twice this way. And I mean, it was, the, it was all the way to the fletch every time. But we had to, we were stopping it. Like I said, mm -hmm. if we wouldn't have had a target behind it, we'd have had some bastards. But we want to catch it just to see what the bone did. You know, it hits a foam, it's not going to bend it or anything. And then see what the broad did. And we actually found some flaws in it and we corrected those because we had a couple of tip ends on that particular model, but not on mine. But it's really pretty amazing what you can do. You're going to, brother, if you can get, you can. Get 200 grand broadheads. I'll tell you what you should do. This is totally self serving Shoot the 200 grand <laughs> broadhead and shoot a 200 grand three blade, which of course we sell. I'm serious. But I don't care which one. Get a machined three blade that's 200 grains. They're super easy to sharpen. They don't stop. Cordon two won't be a problem on a deer. Not preferred, but we're getting close to deer season. So the whole sharpening thing's kind of a pain in the ass to learn in a month and a half or whatever it is. I'll be fishing, by the way. Well, that's not true. I think it's Colorado. So I got to go do that. But, um, and shoot 200 grains and give it a go. You're not going to be too crazy. You're going to be right at 550. And you're going to see them. They're going to go through deer like they want, they're, like they're not there. Mm -hmm. You're going to be crying because Jake Hubschman was bitching at me when I got him to shoot adult arrows. I keep losing them. Yeah. Well, that is that is something I've I've appreciated about you like thus far is just how how bluntly you put things and because I I hate I hate I hate when when people try to overcomplicate things like almost when it comes to like deer hunting tactics and strategies and stuff how 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 people talk about oh you know. I get there's thermals involved. I get, you know, the moon's involved. I get, you know, wh whatever the hell a J hook is. There's 50 different names for, for 50 different things. That Saddle can be a bench. Just, just, just stuff that can be super simplified, but, but, and may maybe I don't have the best analogies, but get good at the basics is, is kind of like my motto. And then everything else, I guess you can kind of learn with time, but I a hundred percent believe that people who's really good at the basics will out hunt people that knows a few, you know, flashy strat strategies right. that That's you right. only use probably 1% of the time. If that, I think a lot of it's a lot simpler than you think. Like one of the things that we've done to the pigs out here is I've started to set up my stands where you can do a long, clean approach into the, into the stand. Mm -hmm. I'm talking 400 yard approach, not 50 yards. And, I'm, and a clean means wind in your face, not a lot of cover around you, like big open spaces, and then the feeder will be on the edge of the booger stuff, mm -hmm. which makes a lot of sense. But if it's north wind, I won't hunt the – I've got three stands you can't hunt on the north wind. You just don't do it because you're walking in blowing them out. Right. right. Once I started doing that one simple thing, like to your point, you find two or three simple things to keep doing, it's going to be it's going to be great for your success rate and then just go hunting. Right. Mm -hmm. And really, really, just to get back to the topic at hand, arrows are completely overlooked by 90% of the bow hunters out there. And they're, they're the only thing that kills them. Well, there's that's not, there's just not enough concentration on it. I've got a gal in Mexico. She's 13 years old. She's 35 pound recurve. She's a 700 grain arrow with a tough head. That's the three inch long, one inch wide. Those broadheads are awesome. And 
she's regularly getting penetration to the fletchings on white-tailed deer and pigs with a 35-pound recurve. Yeah, they can't be going 100 feet per second. The barrel flight is beautiful. Just goes, dong. The videos are, they send them to me all the time. <laughs> all the way to the fletch. It's unbelievable well, to watch her do it. Well, I mean, having she's you. Under 15 yards, she's on bait, right? It's not, mm -hmm. it's a little set up. Got it. Got it. But go watch YouTube and watch everybody whacking around with their 80 pound bows getting, I got seven inches of penetration. Woo! <laughs> Well, it, it like having you break it down and stuff, it, it really doesn't seem that complicated. Kind of like you said, like within the first five minutes, it was, it was, you know, if it's going wonky, trim it down, you know, until it's just shooting dead. And like, granted, I haven't put a lot of thought into this, but there's, I've listened to a lot of people talk on a lot of different podcasts about, about certain things, because what I do for a living is I mow rich people grass. That's basically what I say. And, uh, so I have a lot of time listening to podcasts and stuff, and there's a few things that, that resonate, I think throughout certain podcasts, if any, but just listening to you, I'm, I feel bad for you. You've had to talk and put up with this for two hours now, but no, it's there's, so, there's so, so lot, many, don't ask a lot of great questions. We've actually gone a little, we're on topic, but not the same way normally. It's normally mm -hmm. me talking about the 12 factors to try to make everybody's head spin. Your questions have been <laughs> phenomenal. They've been well, spot on with some of the, a lot of the curiosity and the, actually some of the hate mail I get. Um, we've answered a lot of things and made some sense of it, uh, I think. But man, you're, y'all are welcome to email me or whatever. I mean, Jake, I'm going to tell you one thing to watch. Mm -hmm. Go on my channel and look for the four fletch tuning video. I know you're probably not shooting four fletch. Don't worry about that. I am shooting. Oh, he is. Yeah. Oh, you are. Okay. Yeah. Then that's my knock tuning. So get 200 grain points, get some 250s, shoot them against 300s. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then look at that video on how to rotate the knock and, and, and super tweak them. And that's, okay. a, that's a really good way to start getting them to fly and then find yourself a good three blade machined head. I have a three blade sharpening video on my channel. I'm going to try to pump it, but I mean, the information. <laughs> No, it's they're good. really easy to sharpen. They don't bend or break. The points are kind of pyramided, so they don't fold over. Um, and they'll just go through them like lightning. I really, if if I didn't wasn't such a big single level fan because what I've seen it do to bone, I'd be shooting three blades all the time. I'd be shooting a machine through blade all the time. So let's uh let's put a bow on it this way. Um, we've talked a ton about arrows, a ton about broadheads. If you had to give people, um, I've seen kind of a scale or a recommendation for arrow weights. What is an adult arrow? What is a Twizzler? Can you kind of define those things before we wrap up? <laughs> like in grains, what's the weights? I had it at one time. I haven't said this in a long time, so we'll do it here. It's like that shotgun shell box you used to read when you were a little kid. So you got target load. That's between 350 and 450 grains. They, I mean, they're fun to shoot, but they ain't worth a damn killing anything. So 450 to 550 is like a heavy dub load. 550 to 650 is a Magnum. And 650 plus is an adult arrow. Nice. I I'm have been years and years and years and years, and I say it over and over again, perfect arrow flight, 550 and cut on contact. Somewhere around 550, it's got to fly. If 525 flies a little wonky and you're a speed dork, but 570 is like, you could shoot it like that and it's consistently accurate, you shoot the 570. Vice versa. If you're one of these guys who's got to have a 900 gray arrow and it's flying sideways, you are pissing up a rope. The damn thing's got to be accurate. So there's people in both camps. There's people who've gone totally, had way too much fairy dust, and they're decided they're going to shoot 750 grains, and the arrows don't fly that good. When 680 or 50 was absolutely a freaking laser. Mm -hmm. You shoot what, it's what's accurate, and it has to be broadhead accurate. Field points are liars. 
So, Jake, that's why I say that if you don't have any 200 grand brought in, I know a guy. His name's oh, yeah. <laughs> I will mail you a damn 200 grand brought in, uh, five million of them. And you can, you can, I'm, I'm serious. Open invitation, I've got them. I'll send them to you. But, and so you can fly broad heads. So I think you wrap a bow on this. One of the last thought, I guess, you got to shoot broad heads. You have to. And so I think that's one of the greatest. Uh, sharp broad heads is a huge problem, really sharp. Like sharpening, touching them up, making sure they're sharp, even if they're right out of the package, hunting sharp, bullshit, check them. But you got to shoot broad heads. And if they fly a little weird every once in a while, they're going to fly real weird when you're in distress. When you're, when you're in a saddle, back here, and when you were in perfect form, six cigarettes in, and 12 warm-up shots, and your broad heads are still flying a little weird, three hours in the saddle, and a weird angle, the arrow's going to fly a foot off. It's just a disaster. Makes sense. No, I will. I will. I will try. I will try that because you can ask Christian before the, before the podcast, like I was, I was dead set on the, on the expandables. I was dead set on basically the, uh, the white tail specials and stuff. Like I told him a few days ago that that's probably what I'm going to be shooting this year. Mm -hmm. But after, after this conversation, I hate to say it. And I'm not just saying that because we got the ranch ferry on here, but I'm, I'm going to have to try it. I'm going yeah, to have to try it. Yeah. You won't be sad. And watch my vital V video. You got to shoot them when they die. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, <laughs> that's, that's you a completely a different issue. Tuning thing. And how to show the three blades and vital V. I mean, aim. go to that knuckle on a broadside shot and go up about an inch and it'll send it. Well, that would work good because, because my previous problem has been always uh, hugging the shoulder rather than getting back into the, you know, where you're wanting to hit it, like, I don't know, two inches back from the, from the shoulder and hit lungs. That's kind of where the white tail, I mean, heck, you know, you, you know, all about the goods and the insides and stuff, but, uh, that's always what I've worried about is hugging the shoulder. And so you're going to be giggling like a jackass eating a prickly pear. Well. <laughs> <laughs> when you shoot them, when you get above that knuckle and shoot them right on the crease or a little bit in front of it, they will literally mm -hmm. go 50 yards. Okay. They go into yeah. they go into cardiogenic shock, and there's no they cannot run. You cannot run when you're freaking. If you cut the radiator hoses on your truck, it will melt in a very short amount of time. That's it's right. just like that. So this is completely off topic, but I'm going to go ahead and ask you just since we have it on there. The void within the whitetail's anatomy. Since since you've probably looked, gave more uh, what is what's called autopsies on 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 animals than anyone mm -hmm. I know. Is there a void within like a whitetail anatomy? If that makes I sense. think Is there's there a possibility that you could catch them on an inspiration cycle and it wants to be a little bit smaller, but they don't go like this. The 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 lungs or the or the rib the cage. Lungs. Right. So the, the theoretical void is on the spine. Mm -hmm. Right? When you hit them high. Lungs are round, relatively uh, stiff substructures. They don't tend to collapse. It's not a balloon. Is balloons are hollow. Okay. Lungs are full of all kind of airways and cartilage and all kind of stuff. So they tend to support their own mass. So they don't compress like 50% when you inhale because your diaphragm folds up. There's a bunch of stuff going on there. I don't think the void exists. I think it's, I think you hit the top of the lungs and you just don't, I think they're fine. I don't think, I think the lungs don't collapse. Really? No, no, okay. I do. I, I really do. I don't think the lungs collapse at all. I think you put a very small wound in them and they just live. I just don't think they die at all. They're tough. That's, that's... The other thing that I really do believe from watching, and y'all need to y'all need to go look at some shots and watch the deer jump what drop. 99% of the time I bet they're rolling and you one, you nick one lung. So they're not, they're not doing this. They're rolling away. So that lungs are rolling and you're hitting the top of one, the other one's fine. And it's just not that devastating for them. 
Yeah. Animals are pretty durable, man. God only knows what happens to them out there and they survive. <laughs> oh, yeah. You only get to see it on the pigs because pigs are all cantankerous and chew on each other all the time. Their ears are all torn up. They got big gashes in them from their buddies beating on them. They fight beer brawls and bar fights and all that stuff. But deer don't tend to do that. But you know they've been scratched by a few things, nipped by a coyote, grabbed by the leg, got, got away with it. They're, they're the ones... Uh, <laughs> Dr. Grant said this to me on the phone one time. He said the animals we're hunting are the top of the species, genetically speaking. The dumb ones, he did, he's more eloquent than this, but he said the, the, the dumb fat ones are dead. It makes sense. So the ones you're hunting are the top Olympic athletes. If they're four-year-old deers in that Olympic level, that level is reliable. And all the, you know, knuckleheads got eaten. The ones that made big mistakes. So he said, you're really hunting something that's really on point. That's a good point. Well, thank you so much for doing this. Thank you for giving us over two hours of your time. And we no, really no appreciate problem. the conversation. Yeah, no, I'm going to go cut trees now. <laughs> Catch that 10 pounder. Load hey. up the boat tomorrow. Go fishing again. <laughs> there you go. Before you do that, let, let people know where they can find you, where they can shop your stuff, where they can get all this good information we've been talking about. Well, it's really simple. I have the most unique name on the earth. So just Google Ranch Ferry and you'll find everything. It's literally awesome. I had no marketing plan on that, but it's so weird. I am uh, sponsored by Magnus and by, uh, and by Sirius Archery. I have a store called the Ranch Ferry Store. We have arrow systems, bear shaft kits, two different kind of broadheads. Got single bevels. We've got three blades. All the stuff we've talked about. My, most importantly, my email is Troy at ranchway.com and I'm also the ranch on Instagram. If you have questions, I'm unlike the rest of the world. I will freaking help you. The 1% best guys will not. Some of them have an email system that says, sorry, I don't answer questions. But I'm here to help the general public kill their damn deer. And if you do, and you send me a picture and I will post it on my Instagram. Because I love nothing better than kicking the freaking industry in the nuts when there's a <laughs> picture of a broken humorous ball. Uh, and I'll, if they've got the humorous, the deer is dead. <laughs> yeah, that's true. You don't just get a humorous back. Ah, I shot a deer and the humorous fell out. That never happens. <laughs> right? I love it. I love yeah, it. Like, I've had Ooh. three guys hit them in the forehead and kill them. Taking quartering two shots and the deer jumped so hard they ducked and it went right between the eyes, three of them and their arrows just sticking out both sides are like, that's awesome, man. I'm going to shoot them there more often. They don't run at all. I've done that, unfortunately, one time and it didn't work out on accident. Oh. I was very young. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. It was last year. No, yeah. but uh, <laughs> I am. Well, I didn't know. I didn't know. Like, that's the that's the crazy thing about it is I, I thought arrow like you tweaking around on your arrow, I thought that was just baloney, to be honest. Because before it was like it's overcomplicated. I have that. My I'm a tight ass. You know that. I know that. And it's she just like why? Clenched. Why would I? If it ain't broke, don't fix it. The thing is, I didn't know it was broke. To some extent. To some extent. To some extent, right? But like, if you think about it in the way he put it, it was already somewhat broke. It wasn't broke. It was cracked. Yeah. It was cracked. Are you gonna Are you gonna sit in your saddle and you hang from your tether if your rope's a little bit frayed? I will. I'm cheap. Yeah, no, I'm same here. <laughs> but if you think about it from a safety standpoint, yeah, no, you shouldn't. So I mean that it it makes sense. It makes sense, and I hate to say it. I hate to say it, and I told you this. I'd, I'd probably never do this, but I think I think I'm gonna try. Try fixed, try and, fixed the broadhead, and that's the thing. But the thing is, is Exus would need to send us some two fifties, so they need to get on that. Y'all listen, <laughs> Jake. Yeah, that's Cam. Right. Well, I hope that everybody that listened, um, their brains are rattled. Um, I've listened to some of the Ranch Ferry stuff. I haven't consumed all of it, but after talking with them two hours, um, common sense prevails. So that is true. It's just like when you were a kid. I took 30 out six bullets. I didn't know if they were 140 grains or 380 grains. I grabbed them out of the safe. And when they shot two foot low, I'm like, what's going on? Yeah. What's wrong with these? <laughs> so it, it does. I mean, you're killing an animal. It takes a little bit of thought, but re the reality is if you get it right one time, you're good. You don't got to worry about it again. 
That is that is true. That is true. I mean, there there's just a lot to process here, so I don't even know. Like, they're gonna have to sleep on it. I am. I'm going. I, I mean, it, yeah, yeah. That's all I'm well, going to say. Thank you guys for listening. Uh, we got more cool episodes coming up soon, so uh, stay tuned. Make sure to subscribe. We'll catch you guys in the next one. Jesus loves you. Bye. <laughs> Thank you guys so much for checking out the Hunter's Advantage podcast. If you enjoyed the episode, make sure to leave us a rating and review on Apple Podcast, Spotify, YouTube, or wherever you listen to the podcast. Thank you guys so much, and we'll see you in the next episode.